welcome to those of you joining us online. Uh, we are kicking off uh, this AI Pulse afternoon with a series of keynotes and panels. My name is Lorna Miller. Usually, I'm the VP of oper uh, Revenue Operations at Scaleway, but this afternoon, I'll be your MC. Uh, I'm very excited to be here today. I've been a scaler for a little over a year, and I have to say, after attending this morning's um, keynotes and announcements and being here and uh, having chats with so many of you, it feels like I'm in the epicenter of tech this afternoon. Very exciting time to be a scaler and very exciting time to be here in France discussing AI. So to kick us off this afternoon, uh, to talk to us about the past, present, and future of LLMs. We have research scientist at Meta, Thomas Sialom. Hello, everyone. Thanks for having me. So today I'll talk uh, about technical aspect of large language models, surprise. So, but first, you know, we released Galactica's uh, scientific language model one, one year ago this week, which means ChatGPT was not released one year ago. At what moment of the history we had a technology created in Silicon Valley, the west of America, that in less than a year has been adopted by top developers, to the far end of India. I think that's just unprecedented scale. So I'll start with a brief history. I mean, this is a very uh, new field. Um, so first, what is a large language model? What is just a language model? Language models is a model, in general, a transformer. You all heard about that. It's based on weight, the parameters, combined with the data. So data is what? All the token in the internet, all the word in the internet. And we train that on a task, which is a next token prediction. Basically, you have this architecture, the transformer, that is trained to predict the next word of all the text in the internet. Let me give you an intuition of why this is working. Um, if you are naive and you try to predict uh, the next word, and I give you, I don't know, like millions of examples about calculus. 3 plus 3 equals 6, 4 plus 4 equals 8, and you try to predict what is after the equal. This is the task of, the task of next token prediction. N if you are naive, you can just memorize everything. That's a way to learn to predict the next token. Now, if you compress so what is underneath the data, the true uh, algorithm that explains the next token, well, the most beautiful compression here will be to, un to compress the algorithm of calculus of some. And this is my intuition of what those algorithms are doing. Based on weights trained on data, they compress the log of the thoughts of humanity, which is text. So, there's two things about um, scaling. You can scale the weight, or you can scale the data. More words, more text, it's a dimension of scaling. And the architecture, the weight, is the other dimension. In early days, for GPT-3, OpenAI did some scaling laws. They tested, so basically, the batch size, um, which is scaling the number of tokens, the word. They tested other things like the weight. And what they found is scale is working you get better results by scaling, by scaling mostly the weights, not the data. So this is what they found here, for instance, on a question answering task. Just, it's the beauty of this, you apply the same recipe, a transformer predicting the next token, just you scale, which means the same recipe with just an architecture with more weight. And you get some improvement consistently. Yet they had done a small mistake that was um, explained in the Chinchilla paper. They thought we should scale only the weights, but that was, there was a mistake when they did the experimental protocol. And in fact, you should scale not only the weights, but also the data. And there are some rules. 
So what was really nice in this paper, Chinchilla from DeepMind, was they trained uh, before a gopher. That was a model of 270 uh, billion parameters with some huge amount of compute. And what they did is they did at small scale, uh, below like 10 billion parameters, a lot of experiments. And they figured out some laws, some scaling laws, that given a compute you, that you have, let's say the same Van Gopher, actually there's a balance to follow, which is maybe a smaller model with more tokens, so for the same exact compute, you will get better results. This is what they did, and just extrapolating from, them, from their laws, their empirical laws, they trained Chinchilla, a 70 billion model, that get better results than Gopher, as expected. So, you should scale the weights, but also the data. Yet, I think Lama is about rethinking compute optimal. So, Chinchilla, you know, you have a compute, your goal is to get in a research paper the best results to given a compute, which is fixed. But truth is, if you want your model to be used by a lot of people, which I hope is the case for most of the people uh, doing research, the thing is, scaling the weights, you have two dimensions again, the data and the weights. If you scale the weights, more weights, bigger architectures, cost more at inference time when you use in practice the model. Scaling the data, it doesn't cost most. It's just a dimension that you can remove at inference time. And so, Lama is about rethinking compute optimal by kind of over, um, it's like beyond the chinchilla trap, as we say uh, in the research community. Like, you don't want to get to the best result in your paper. Maybe that for the same amount of compute, we'll have get better scores at Meta. But you can see here the training loss that still decreases. And so you can continue to train with even more compute, the small models, and get good results. And so this is what we had. It, it was also released in a non-commercial way, but for the first time, the research community had access to a larger language model. That is good. And it's also small, so there are some people that already put that in like some C++, Raspberries, and on running on phones. It, it had uh, lead to like more than 7,000 research projects based on that. But it was released in a non-commercial way. It was not a chat model, just a base model. And so we worked on Lama 2, but we released uh, last July. I'll deep dive on the new technology that we did for Lama 2 compared to Lama 1, which is mostly the chat aspect, what we call RLHF instruction tunings. So when we train with these models, starting from a base model, a pre-trained model, how to align that with respect to human preference and to become like a chat model. You ask annotators to create data. They write a prompt, a question, and the answer that you will have wanted ChatGPT to answer you. This is like supervised fine tuning. It's standard in machine learning. And the thing here is you have to get some annotators that are very creative and high quality. Like, I could not find this kind of uh, diversity in the examples. I would write a poem uh, for the table of uh, materials. But you have a second method, which is based on human preference. Human preference is leveraging the language model itself, so that the annotators just write the prompt, and we generate two answers from the models that we have, and we just ask the, the human annotators which one it, he prefers. If you ask me at the beginning of the project, I would say, I prefer supervised fine-tuning, it's gold data, annotated only by human, not by, by a model. But this costs like 10 times less, because the annotator doesn't have to write the output, so maybe it scales better. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So, the amazing thing about a reward model, though, training, so because when you have the classification between like a, the human preference, this is a good output, this is a bad output, this is just training a classifier, what we call a reward model, so that the model is, t is trained to say, this is a good output, this is a bad output. And you know, like, evaluating chat models is extraordinarily difficult. It's like, by definition, by construction, multitask models. But evaluating a classification model is trivial. It's binary, true or false. And so with more data, we could see that we increase the results for Lama 2 of our reward model, meaning that 
for the same recipe, applying a better reward model will lead to better chat models. Here is an intuition of reinforcement learning with human preference. If you have your uh, prompt, a question, and you sample from one to 100 examples, well, the median, if you take any of the outputs, it won't change. The score is consistent from your classification. But if you take the, mass, the maximum among all the trajectories, among all the outputs that your model has generated, well, it increases because you are more likely to generate a trajectory which is better than the others. And so, reinforcement learning here, we developed a re rejection sampling algorithm. It's just to generate a lot of uh, sequences, take the max, train your model on that, and so the potential gain of the algorithm is the gap between the max and the median. We had some relative improvements during all the projects. And so you can see that the distribution with respect to the reward model shift to the right, meaning that our outputs are now better and better according to our reward model. So here is the progress through the project. In fact, I think we went quite fast from uh, when we started in February to the July release. Uh, you have all our iterative progress. And we measured the, the results using as a judge GPT-4. And we compare the win rate between ChatGPT from OpenAI and our model. And so we asked GPT-4, this is the two outputs, which one do you prefer for helpfulness and with respect to safety? And at the end of the project, before the release, we reached to something which means more than 50%. According to GPT-4 OpenAI model, our model is better on both dimensions than ChatGPT. So here is a cool example of uh, temporal perception emergence uh, that we observed. I was surprised by this result when I saw that. Maybe you can put some system prompt telling the what year you are for the language model. And the language model will adapt its answer. And for instance, you said, you don't have any information after uh, the 40s. This is not true. Like The language model had some information. But then the language model adapted its answer. And the same like if you said, is your flat or not, based on what year, if you had information about satellite, GPS, to, to prove that, the answer is not the same than when you said you are in the years of uh, 800. But now let me tell you a bit about the real magic behind RLHF. So I told you, when I started the project, I thought with an infinite budget, I will go for supervised fine-tuning data, because this is like gold data annotated by humans. I, I was wrong, and hopefully we realize that very soon in the project. Let me give you an intuition. If I ask you, write a haiku, you know, like this is like the small three lines uh, poems uh, in Japanese, about large language models. I will give you like 10 seconds to think what you can come with. I try to find a good haiku for large language models, like three lines, few words. And I don't know if someone came with something good, I could spend an hour and not find anything great. And yet, this is what, in like one second, our language model generated. And to me, this is pretty good. And what we found out during the project, is that very soon, we were super surprised that the outputs of our model, when we evaluated them compared to the human annotation, it was better. We were like, maybe the annotators are not good. And the truth is that the language model is already better than most of the humans at writing tasks. And so, the true magic behind RLHF is not reinforcement learning, it's not human feedback. It's to give a tool to humans to create data at a superhuman level performance that no human could create. And so, the future directions in this regard would be about not reinforcement learning or human feedback, but how can we leverage these models to create, in synergy with humans or not, some new data that will become even more and more complex and better. So let me tell you now, to finish this talk, about what I believe will come next. First thing is uh, multimodality. This has started, you have seen, like, for instance, on OpenAI, um, like GPTV with the vision to process some image inputs. Meta released some multimodal uh, models with image edit yesterday. This is just the beginning. Um, 
we are clearly going to a direction where, you know, like five years ago when I started my PhD, we were like developing new architectures, and research papers were about proposing new architectures. Nowadays, it's only transformers. And we apply transformers on language model. We apply transformers on uh, image, on speech. And so we are progressively moving to like aligning all those modalities in a single model. It's not yet, yet the case, but we are going there. There's a lot of engineering things for which we know from the research perspective it is working. And like you can connect um, generating image as a tool. This is what OpenAI just did, and that works pre pretty well. You can connect image uh, modalities in a fully connected way to the model. That works well as well. Now there's yet some research questions like, what about generating long-form videos? Imagine to not ask like uh, Lama2 or ChatGPT to generate a text or a summary, but now a video, and you can query it, question it on the fly. We are not there yet, and there's some of research questions that remain open. One of the second big direction is about um, gi giving access to the web, to the models, and more generally giving access to tools. Like tools is something very unique for humans. Like we are kind of going beyond our capabilities by creating tools. That's what we have done in the history of humanity. And right now we are giving access for the first time to tools to the language models. Like you have seen like the plugins. One month before that, uh, from the release of OpenAI at Meta, we had Toolformer paper, created tools to transformers. And that goes beyond what a language model is capable of, beyond the weights of the model's abilities. By, I mean, something very simple to say and silly, like, why asking the language model, ChatGPT, to do some calculus, some sum, which requires, like, multi billions matrix calculus, if you can just give it access to a calculator? But you see, like, now you can have also access to the web, and so updated content, and augmented output, expert output. And soon you can expect also the language model to create their own tools with some, because they have some ability to code and to program. And so that's an all new uh, universe of, for research and products. Research because right now, those language models are trying to predict what comes after the, some text, some data we extracted from the web, as like next token prediction. Like, let me give you an example. If now I predict something, like so, some code, I said, oh, I want to lower uh, case all my text. And the model generates a code to do that. But now he can execute the code, see what an input gives as an, and what is the output from the real world grounded in code execution. Then the language model can re reflect its own expectations. And so the last thing is robotics. This is much more like long term. Yet it has started quick, uh, small, uh, slowly. OpenAI invested 20 million in a robotic company. Tesla is pre pretty well positioned with their uh, technology. And we had seen some paper connecting language models to robots and indicating some good results. I don't know how fast it will go, but this is a clear direction. And you can expect just the same way you can ground language models to like reality in a digital world with like code execution, search engine, etc. You can go to the next level, grounding it into the reality with like some sensors of the real force that acts here. So, also a new breakthrough is expected. Like, what this decade of AI told us is there's something unlikely that will happen for sure. What it is, I cannot tell you. Well, I don't take a lot of risk here. Uh, but I'm pretty sure in the next three years, something that no one saw coming will emerge. But there's something which is highly predicted, highly predictable, compute. Um, I mean, compute is like so in demography in social science. This is a force that we can predict from like the last 50 years with the Moore's law, and now it's accelerating with even more and more compute. Uh, Jensen from NVIDIA will not tell uh, the opposite. And um, the thing is, we are getting more and more compute into those models, and the biggest question is, are these language models, stochastic parrot, just generating text uh, as a parrot, or are they truly understanding the underneath behind the data? And so that's the big question. 
some people think that compute is all you need, scale is all you need, and with more compute, the same recipe will keep increasing and give better results. Some people think it's not the case. I don't know. I think the fact that uh, this model can compress information in such a beautiful way can mean they yet understand what is behind the data. Will it be enough? I don't know. Um, yet, what I can tell you is that we haven't finished with the scaling laws, and we can put more compute in the small models, in the bigger models. We will have, for sure, in the next five years, better and better models with the same recipe. And so, I will conclude with maybe we had the Copernicus moment of uh, intelligence. Like, you know, Copernicus was like, um, after finding that Earth is nothing special, a normal planet uh, orbiting a normal star in a normal galaxy. Maybe, we don't know, uh, we will learn that intelligence is nothing too crazy as well. It's just a bunch of matrix, matrix multiplications. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so the next session will start at 2.35. So those of you who need to find uh, space, please do so. Uh, and those of you joining us online, stay tuned. Thank you.
thanks for joining us again. Uh, our next session, as you can probably see right behind me, is on optimizing the infrastructure efficiency for scalable deep learning. Please welcome to the stage our next speaker, Senior VP for Products at DDN, James Kummer. Hello, hello. Hey, thanks very much. Thanks very much. As you can tell, I'm from the UK, uh, so lovely to be here in France. Thanks very much, Scaleway, for inviting me. Uh, before I start, um, can I just ask you all one question? Some hands, please. Who has heard of DDN in this audience? Right, there's about three. Uh, you know, I'm actually also secretly responsible for marketing in my company, so this isn't a good, a good answer. Anyway, um, people's minds tend to be sitting, I think, in the GPU or the CPU. So uh, when you guys think about AI, I imagine that you're thinking it from, from the sort of CPU and GPU perspective. What we're going to do today is kind of think about what it'd be like to be the storage system and talk about the sort of problems we see as a company that builds storage systems and you know, how we make the whole process of developing large language models much more efficient. There's some numbers in here. This is a technical talk, um, so we'll see how, uh, how blank the faces look in a couple of slides' time. Well, this one's not too bad, a simple pie chart. Uh, but essentially, we're, we're characterizing the problem here. So I say, we are a company that builds the largest, fastest storage systems for the biggest supercomputers and superpods in the world. So customers of ours, one of the biggest customers actually is NVIDIA. Um, Scaleway is a customer. We also have many customers in, let's say, government, um, uh, very large social media companies, etc. We build very fast, very scalable storage systems. It tends to be hardware, runs in the cloud, but also in racks, in data centers, and usually connects by very fast wires uh, to a bunch of GPUs or CPUs, a large compute infrastructure. So that's what we do. And our customers, spend money like this, roughly speaking. Uh, when it, so then they, when they build a super pod or a large uh, AI infrastructure, approximately their spend is going to be this pie chart. Most of it's going to be on the compute bit. Um, quite a lot is going to be on power and cooling and networking and other bits and pieces. And then about 5% is going to be on the storage system, which is obviously not enough. It should be much more, right? Um, but the question for us is, as a 5% piece of the pie, what can we do competitively to make everything much more efficient? How can storage make the rest of the pie do more work? And that's really our job as a company. So let's talk about AI. Uh, I've kind of done a very approximate view of what happens in the end-to-end -end large language model training process. You ingest data. Now, remember, you are thinking as a storage person now. You're a storage thing. You're thinking inside the storage. What happens when you ingest data? That's a write pattern you're getting written to. And then there's going to be some preparation. You're going to get lots of reads, lots of writes, lots of messy stuff. Then you're going to start training your model. This is typically a large distributed training problem, like maybe 128 DGXs running for maybe a month to do one model like GPT-3. During that process, we're going to go through multiple epochs. So train, check, train, check error, train, check error. And for every one of those little stages, we're going to be moving data in to train the model with. We're going to be moving the model into memory as well, not all of the time, but some of the time. We're going to be checkpointing, writing out the model into persistent storage. And also, at the end of that time, when we've got something cool, which we can, we can send to our customers, we're going to distribute that model. And that's a read from a storage perspective. So that'll give you a little idea about you know, the sort of things going on in our minds. And we go really deep into this stuff, trying to optimize all these things. Now, I'm going to tell you maybe just two stories about you know, what that means to optimize this, these data patterns. And remember, back to the first chart, the reason is hundreds of millions of dollars being spent. If we can save 5%, 10%, and give it back to real training, that's a real win for our customers. Oh, we got complicated already. Uh, so fundamentally, as a storage system, We've got these like, kind of nice, kind of symmetrical um, sort of, uh, geometries to solve, fundamentally, to get, a, to get an efficient system. 
what you're looking at the top there is the application the thing that says AI. You know, it's a large language model being trained in a, in a compute system. And then at the bottom is all the storagey stuff. And there's many architectures, but the ones you're probably familiar with, if you're not familiar, at least you probably use them, are, are like this. Usually using NFS. Who's heard of NFS in the audience? That's, it's more than I've that's, 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 that's a lot, actually. Uh, so NFS is the standard protocol for sharing data across a network. The problem is, the compute nodes don't know where the data is. They have to go to a server, and then that server has to go find the data. Which means you all need this second network. You need something else down here in order for the servers to go find the data in this large shared infrastructure. Now, we build a parallel file system. And a parallel file system, we move some intelligence into the compute. That looks like this. So now, What's really happening is that the clients, the compute nodes, the applications, almost, know where the data is and go and get it directly. So they can go in, in parallel, move data directly from where it resides into the application. So within one fell swoop, we've halved the complexity of the system and also made it much, much more scalable. Now, that's rather a general point. Let's go in a bit more detail precisely about AI training. So here's our epochs, multiple epochs. We're training, we start over, over here, and we move over here in time. And every epoch, we're going to take a piece of data, and we're going to push it into this distributed set of 128 NVIDIA systems or, or other sort of uh, AI compute systems. And then in between those data loads, we're going to do some training, change our parameters, exchange parameters with our peers, all this kind of stuff you probably know about. Um, but the problem is here, and NVIDIA came to us about, um, so NVIDIA bought a system called Selene, or they built a system called Selene about four years ago. Uh, that was number five in the top 500 supercomputers, um, the biggest AI supercomputer in the world. And they used DDN for that. And then about two years ago, they said, we've got a problem here, because this is a real pain. We keep having to move a lot of data around. Um, and it seems a bit unnecessary, because actually that's the same data every time. Same data, same data, same data. So we did one thing, uh, which turned out to be very beneficial. And this graph is super complicated, but they came from NVIDIA, so it's their fault. At the top here, conventional stuff. What we're doing, what you're seeing this graph is, you're sitting on the DGX, and you're watching all the I.O. coming in and out. And conventionally, you see every epoch, we move this data across the network, the purple thing that says net. And what we did was we set some, basically, automatic caching in the DGX systems, which have SSDs, and we used our intelligence in the compute to basically keep data there, because it might be reread, and we, we can read it from local disk rather than moving across the network. So we switched on, so we built hot nodes, we sent it to NVIDIA, and they ran hot nodes, and they saw this. So now, the first epoch is messy, because not, not only are we reading, we're also writing into the local flash. But then subsequently, there's no network traffic. We're just re reading from local NVMe. Uh, and what that did was skim off 3% of the runtime, which doesn't sound too big, right? It's not that big, it's only 3%, it sounds it's measly. But of course, we just switched on a feature, and we've now saved 3% of a $100 million data center, if you like. We added 3% more productivity. So they were very pleased by this. Um, and so we did some more work to that ilk. But essentially, we've got a, a magic caching algorithm that saves 3%. But also, we're not moving data across the network. So that network can do other things. So that was kind of part two of my little story about you know, what storage people do to make data go faster, to make infrastructure more efficient. What's the third thing we do? Well, we have a sort of a dialogue with our customers and with competitors and stuff. And typically, people imagine that AI is a read-intensive problem which is kind of seems true, right? All you're doing is you're training this model. You just keep pushing data in. It might be video files, might be images. Um, it could be anything like that. Um, but actually, it turns out that half the time we're writing stuff. It's half of its reads and half of its writes. So what is all this write stuff doing? Um, little example there, for example. All writes, this is a little example where you're holding it in memory. Uh, but what's happening with these writes? They turn out they're checkpoints. So you're taking the model, which is in memory, distributed across the systems, and we're taking a state at a certain point in time, and we're writing it all to disk for persistence. So why do we want to do it? And this is actually a picture that came from uh, uh, Celine. 
Uh, this was training Megatron LM on NVIDIA Selene. We're moving 150 gigabytes um, across the network quite regularly. What are these checkpoints for? Well, we keep running this large job. Remember, it might run for months, uh, and it runs across 100, 100 or so DGXs. We're going to take the state every, let's say, half hour, and we're going to dump it into disk. Now, that's consuming a lot of time, potentially. The reason we do it is because if, for some reason, we want to restart the job, if the job fails, because hardware fails, we can just go back and start from that latest checkpoint. We haven't lost the previous 28 days of runtime. And actually, for the data scientists amongst you, checkpoints aren't really just to uh, prevent you from losing your work if a job fails. It's also used for a lot of other more interesting things, like I might want to take a partially trained model and then retrain it on something else. So maybe a, a, a model's been trained for a specific purpose, and I've got another sort of uh, similar purpose, and I can take a model that's only been partially trained, spawn it off and train against that, checkpoints. And the other one is this sort of overtraining thing. You keep you know, doing model training. At some point, the error gets bigger. It gets worse. And so when you wake up in the morning uh, on Monday and go into work after your, your weekend's uh, supercomputer run, you actually want to go back in time and find where the error was, was smallest. And you need the checkpoint of the model to go and use that later on. So that's all checkpoints. And that's uh, really why we're doing all these writes, um, which I hope was a little bit interesting. And then. The, re the way we kind of make that more efficient is basically by serving those writes very fast. Here's another graph that came from NVIDIA. Uh, they're using a 32 DGX superpod here, uh, and this is the results from our storage system. We're moving 360 gigabytes a second for reads and 270, a smaller number for writes. But the point is we can drive these reads and writes to satisfy both these checkpoints and these data loads. And these checkpoints are important. So this little graph here, this great study, and they show that out of the whole AI training end-to-end, -end, we can consume up to 43% doing these checkpoint activities. And that means if you use uh, a well-optimized, well-architected parallel file system for your storage, you can shave that 43 and move it down to 5 or 10 just by being fast, by moving that data faster in a specific way. And from that, we kind of get this graph. And this graph says, if you get the right storage versus, let's say, an NFS system, you can provide between 5 and 12% more useful training time out of your infrastructure compared with if you'd used, uh, let's, let's say, a non-specialized uh, NFS system. Uh, that's the end of my presentation. Good storage can pay for itself. That 5% uh, that you can pay for well-architected parallel file systems will give you back between 5 and 12% in infrastructure gain and efficiency gains. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. Our next session will begin at 2.55 p.m. Thank you.
Hello again. For those joining us just now, good afternoon. Our next session is a panel on building uh, data sets. So please welcome to the stage Pablo Ducru of Raive, Julien Launay of Adaptive ML, Agathe Arlotti of Akin, and our moderator, Jérôme Rasti. So, hello everybody. Um, so in this talk, we will try to to see a bit about data set. We have like three different companies we see with three different usage of of data set, and we will see the state of the art on data set, and if we have a bit of time, what's next and what will be the, the data set in the future. So I will let them to introduce. So first, Agat, can you introduce you and the company you are working for? Hello everyone, so my name is Agathe Arlotti, I'm working for Okin. So Okin is an AI biotech and the aim of the company is to better understand complex biology through AI model and to accelerate uh, drug development and new diagnostic tools uh, to accelerate and to better treat uh, patients. So it's really uh, for the beneficial impact on, uh, on, on patients. My role at, at Okin is to build relationship with uh, healthcare institutions, so hospitals and research centers, to get access to their data set. Uh, so I have a team of 30 people uh, in Europe, in North America, dedicated to build relationship and build collaborative projects with uh, hospitals to access to the relevant data set for our projects. Okay, Julia. Yeah. Yeah, so, hello everyone, a uh, pleasure to join you today. I'm uh, Julien Lenay, I'm the CEO and founder at Adaptive. So we just got started a few weeks ago. Um, we do reinforcement learning for large language model, which we package in a product that enables company to perpetually improve their models. Um, so we learn a lot from actual user interactions, so actual usage. Uh, and in the past, I've been uh, part of the Falcon project, where we also built a, a very significant web data set, Refined Web. Uh, where that time was kind of the opposite of the spectrum, where it was more like massive, very large scale uh, web data. And Pablo. Thank you. My name is Pablo Ducru. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of uh, Rave. Uh, Rave is a foundation AI company uh, that does images and then video and other multimedia generation. And you can see us in this sense as a version of mid-journey or stability. Um, but we have in mind, how do you make this way more personal? And perhaps how do you respect more the IP, which is a core topic uh, in the multimedia world? So yeah, let's start. So you have three di really different business case. So maybe let's start with Agathe. What data set are you using in your case? So at Okin, we access to real patient data. This is key for us to train the model with uh, the, the data from patients. So the, what I mean by real patient data, it means uh, patient from uh, care, so that are routinely uh, collected when patients are treated at hospitals, and also uh, research data, so additional uh, data from patients that are collected by uh, researchers when they do their, their, their projects. On top of that, we are also generating additional data, like molecular data, uh, genomic data, that are not collected through the classical uh, care system. Uh, it's super important to reach the right level of depth for us in terms of the, the type of data we can, uh, we can get. So it means we have, in the end, multimodal data set. So clinical data, also histology data, which are slides from the pathologist uh, that are obtained through samples uh, when they do biopsies uh, to do the diagnostic uh, of, of, the, of the disease. And on top of that, uh, molecular data, omic data, so RNA-seq data, DNA data, uh, that can add a lot of information uh, about the gene activation from, uh, from patient. Yep. Um, on our side, I mean, um, in the past, kind of uh, gone through the entire spectrum. So as you know, like large language models are typically trained on very large data sets that are essentially all the text you can shove at it. Um, when they come out of that, they obviously don't really answer well to instructions. So the question at Adaptive is how we take them to actually interacting with users. And a lot of our thesis is that actually you can do this by learning from the actual interactions. 
So typically what we do, you know, if you think of a Copilot-like application, I think a lot of people in the room probably have used GitHub Copilot. Uh, whenever you accept or not a suggestion, well, we can learn from that, uh, and we can continuously learn to make the model better. So it's really going, you know, after that kind of like massive first phase where you're just trying to get to the model the sense of the world, uh, of our world, it's really getting it to, you know, be being able to navigate that knowledge and give it to the user in, in the proper way. So at Rave, the data that we're using right now, the first foundation model we're building is an image generation one, and then we're going to go into the video ones. Um, today, the present kind of open source model out there that's most famous is called the Lion data set. The Lion data set uh, essentially scraped from the internet as much uh, images as it could find. So it was about 5.6 billion images, of which only 2 billion are of good enough quality. Um, however, they were not particularly selected for aesthetic purposes, nor were they um, you know, asked for, in terms of copyright, uh, the rights to train on these. And this has actually produced some form of problems in terms of uh, major lawsuits being carried out against OpenAI, against Midjourney, against Stability AI, um, from people who feel that they were not consulted and that this is infringing on their copyrights or uh, other form of, of IP rights. So what we're doing at Rave um, is we're right now constituting our own proprietary data set. We call it Ravium, uh, with the goal of building the best uh, multimedia data set, both on image and video. Um, and the way we're doing this is uh, we're doing it in different approaches. We're first finding online what we can have uh, access to in terms of license that we can pay for or that has the correct number of licenses. We're also going to uh, essentially opening a new market, which is the market of um, licensing data for training. So this is something new. Usually the entire multimedia industry relies from licensing you know, copyrights of certain um, well, images or videos and collecting royalties on these. Now it's a new form of royalties, a royalty for training, but without the distribution rights. Um, so we're one of the pioneers in this field of how do we develop uh, this new type of license for training. Yeah, we'll come back on licenses later. Um, so first, uh, one of the important questions on, on data set is how, how you insert the quality of, of your data set. And so because you have like three different usage or three different metric for, for the quality. So um, yeah, how, how do you use that? And how do you uh, prepare your data set before sending it to the, uh, to the model uh, to make sure you have the, the high level of quality? So in our case, uh, it's, it's key for us uh, to have the highest level of quality, so meaning uh, data that are created by clinicians at hospital level with the medical expertise. So we really need to collaborate closely with uh, medical experts so they can create the data set. They are the, the best ones to actually correct all the data sets. So it's a matter of how we collect the data uh, to closely work with the hospitals. So if it's uh, data that are collected from care, uh, the first purpose is to treat patients. So they are not collected exactly the way we want to have them from uh, an AI um, analysis. So we need to transform the data so that they can become AI ready. So it means they need to be curated, they need to be structured in another way, which was not the initial uh, purpose. Uh, it requires a lot of, of efforts. Most of the time, hospitals are not ready to do this effort, to have additional resources dedicated to that task. So we have our own team that build with uh, the hospital the relevant expertise to do that. Uh, then internally, we can also uh, refine, standardize better, uh, verified uh, the, the way we need to, to do that to accelerate uh, then the, the treatment for our data scientist uh, team internally. Uh, we are also, most of the data we, we access to are retrospective data. So they have been collected for the last uh, 10, 20 years sometimes, uh, with lots of follow-up for patients, so a, a, a high quantity of data, which will require a lot of curation to simplify and to standardize. Now we are also starting to collect prospectively the data, which allow us to create exactly case report form, so uh, uh, ECRF, as we call, we call them, to exactly collect the data at the relevant format and make sure the, the clinical research assistant will help us to collect the data the way we want to have access to them, which is key. Uh, it's, it's essential. It means uh, we have to build this way of collection at the beginning of the process to make sure we will have the relevant level of, of quality in the end. We can, if we access to random data, uh, there is a high chance we will not get uh, to the, 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 the high level of performance we are required for. Or when, when we want to validate the model, we'll have some 
I would say, question. So we will need to re-access to every data set to confirm the results. So I would say anticipating the collection is key for us and closely work with hospital is uh, a very good way to do that. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's different sides of the same coin. Data quality is, is an issue everywhere. So for large language model, typically, I think, there's a component of you cannot be too picky. Uh, I think that, that's a big difference, especially in pre-training. Uh, you need tens of trillions of tokens to train a, a modern large language model. Uh, and there is only so many of them in the world. So at some point, you have to accept some bulk effects. However, there are some, I think what's very interesting with large language model is that the way they perceive quality in a way, in like what gets you better, you know, and performance um, is very different from what you would expect. So for instance, in Falcon, uh, we found that deduplication was perhaps like the strongest, essentially, uh, factor in data quality. So simply running deduplication, which you can do at very large scale, and, and deduplication you can do in a way that's completely agnostic to the underlying content of the data, you know, like Minash or that kind of stuff. You, you don't even really know what's underlying. Um, and this gives you very good results. So there are certainly some aspects of that, but then, Obviously, there is some stuff where you need to go a bit more, you know, hands-on, um, and that includes artifacts, you know, for instance, when you run a web crawler, uh, getting, you know, what's the actual content and what's the boilerplate, what are the ads, you know, that you don't want in. Um, and even further to that, you know, in the late-stage specialization of the model, um, which is um, here, you know, you start to see the influence of very individual data sample of the diversity I think you see it recently with a Fee one project uh, from Microsoft and Fee 2 actually, which was announced, uh, I think, yesterday, um, where you see essentially that by having data that's like textbook data or fake textbook data in that case, since it's generated, you gain a huge uplift in inequality. Um, and I think there is a lot of this, like right now on large language models, there's a lot of, of cool stuff in that direction and kind of also that last mile of data that you can add on top of pre-training, which can take you in completely new direction with very few samples. And that's, uh, that's a really exciting direction. Yeah, what we're doing at Rave uh, with a foundation model for image generation, um, when you're doing a text to image uh, model, what you're doing is you're combining two different versions or um, ways of describing a concept. So if you have a cat and then you describe it as a cat, there's a linguistic form and then there's a visual form. And these two aspects of the data matter a lot and the way you combine them matters a lot and sometimes in ways that are unintuitive. Um, in general, uh, for, you know, for foundation models, more is better. Uh, that's what, uh, what uh, Julien was saying here. However, um, if I'll give you a, a simple example, more uh, cats uh, that are low quality cats will actually help you do bad looking cats. And so sometimes more is not better, uh, it just actually it's a regression to the average. So if what you want here is better looking outputs, uh, prettier images, more cinematic perhaps, you'll have to be very selective, uh, you know, as the dash goes garbage in, garbage out in terms of, uh, you know, training. So you really need to have a real selection of the visual universe that you're putting. So that's the first aspect, and that's one of the reasons why when we're building the Radium data set at Rave, um, we want to work uh, as much as possible with the best sources. So we want to work with the studios, with the stock media companies, and so on, so that we have the highest quality data in terms of visual aesthetics and representation. Uh, another aspect is the breadth. Uh, so I think a good example here is uh, Adobe's Firefly. So Adobe has uh, been an answer, if you want, from the industry to Midjourney or Stability AI that have been a bit considered like the pirates who came in and uh, took everything they could from internet. So Adobe said, well, I have a large corpus of stock media. I'm going to train only on that. Uh, the problem is then it becomes kind of culturally poor. It doesn't know anything other than stock media and cannot generate something that looks outside of the stock media. So the challenge of generating a model that is both respectful of intellectual property, but at the same time has a knowledge breadth uh, that goes beyond stock media um, is one of the core challenges that we're tackling at Rave um, and requires, as I said, a very careful selection of the way you um, take the visual representations. Now there's a second aspect to this, which is the annotation one. I think an interesting viewpoint here is the difference between DALI 2 and DALI 3 is mostly from the annotation of the image and how much you describe it with details. Uh, if you say someone walking the streets of Paris or you're very precise on how there's a light coming and so on, it's the same image. And however, the way you fuse, as we said, the textual world and the visual representation of them really can give way more powerful results at generation. So those are the two aspects that we're working on on Brave. 
Yeah, great. So uh, we are talking also to get uh, a better quality about multimodal. Um, so I think you you all use multimodal now. It, it's it's a new trend, like to 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 push the, the boundary of, of the data set. So how do you implement it uh, within your company, and what advantage uh, multimodal give give to you? So in healthcare, it's really the, the depth of the data we can access. So we started with, uh, so Okin started initially with uh, histology. Uh, so really looking at the, at the slides and being able to, uh, through the annotation, we have exactly the, 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 the same uh, need on that, uh, to, to try to better describe and better characterize the, the, the disease using pathology slide. Of course, to do that, you need to have the clinical information. So uh, the demographic characteristic of the patient, but also all the, the information on the treatment, the survival impact, so all the follow-up I was mentioning earlier. And then uh, if you want to better understand the biology mechanism behind that, basically you need to deep dive behind the image. So you need to access to the gene information. So this is why uh, we added this level of information, which was also going with the, the, the trend in all research projects to, ac to access to um, uh, new technologies and new information. So single cell data, spatial transcriptomic data, we can add a lot of information and will allow uh, to really accelerate the type of, of research. So in our case, it means uh, opening really the door to uh, a better personalized medicine, to be able to large uh, population to subtype the population and identify a subpopulation in which a mechanism is expressed differently, which will better target uh, the, the, the new molecule we try to, to develop. So this is what multimodal data set allow us to accelerate and do better uh, in our case. Yeah, I think on the, on the large language model side, it's still much more boring and, and much less mature than you described. We are very far from having that melting pot of, of different modalities that, that, that learn essentially from one another and that inform each other. I think it, it's kind of funny, one of the big reasons I think a lot of like big frontier labs now are looking into multimodality beyond, you know, it's cool to have a model that can understand images, it's, it simplifies like for some tasks, it's very valuable. Um, I think there is also a question of the amount of data available, very plainly speaking, which is that in terms of text, you know, we are kind of not quite running out, it's a bit of a strong word, but we are reaching essentially the limits of high quality text we can shove into a model and probably the next generation of model will be there essentially, more or less. Um, and so I think there is a big gold rush essentially in knowing, oh, can we find another modality that will inform, you know, uh, that will bring new information to the model and genuine new information. And it's not as obvious as it seems. I think like, you know, as humans, we think, oh, vision is like, for instance, a fundamental component of our, of our life and of how we, we interface with the world. But it seems for models, it's, it's a bit different and it's not so obvious. Obviously, they have an advantage. I've seen pretty much all of the text that we have ever produced, which you have to imagine amounts to quite a bit of knowledge. But um, I think this is a very interesting question and it, it's kind of like a 10 billion, 100 billion dollar question right now of how you can get through multimodality, not just putting the, mod the modalities next to one another and kind of, you know, like hooking them up and hoping for the best, but really getting them to benefit one another, so like a joint multimodality. And there's, there's lots of exciting work on like the chameleon architecture, all that kind of stuff, where um, it's really exciting to see like when it will scale up and what it will give in terms of like scaling laws and like is image data, you know, like how many, uh, how many words is worth uh, an image, essentially. That's kind of what you can quantify. Um, and so far, you know, it seems to be a, a very complicated topic, but this is definitely, uh, I think, what we are going to see in the coming years, and it's, it's a very exciting perspective. So as Julien says, uh, we'll see whether an image is worth a thousand words or not. Um, but um, the, the thing with multimodality is, you know, unlike text that is a self-consistent uh, world, uh, so you just need to train on yourself to understand language, uh, language describes another part of the world that's the reality around us, uh, which is actually why we've called our foundation models at Rave reality. So it's reality zero, reality one coming next year. Um, your, the multimodality is just intrinsic to the way you cannot just describe an image without the language here. So you're already multimodal by definition when you're doing text uh, to image. But if you only learn from images alone, for instance, um, you think the world is 2D. 
How do you know that this object is in front and that object is behind and so on? Uh, so today, uh, a way, for instance, to improve the controllability of generation and if you want to do some uh, you know, editing of images, for instance, um, some fact, uh, interesting data that you can add to control this would be the death map. Uh, so there has been, for instance, uh, you know, deep neural networks that can extract uh, some form of a death map. So we call this 2.5D. They cannot learn this from images alone. So you already have to be multimodal to teach um, from, uh, you know, to teach the, the, the architecture here, uh, the foundation model that, hey, there is depth. Uh, so perhaps you could go on video and extract that just as we do. If we cannot move around or we had two eyes, we could not extract the depth. Um, so this is, uh, I think, in general, the point of multimodality is the image of the elephant, right? So you come here and you touch a, you know, the, the foot or the back or the trunk, but the whole thing is an elephant and you cannot describe it with only one of the modalities. And the more you add, the better understanding you get uh, of the fact that what you have in front of you is an elephant. Uh, so that is ultimately why even going into uh, video generation, we're already seeing that it's gonna be very hard to uh, get some consistency over time with the flow and motion if you cannot have all these type of modalities that represent uh, those different types uh, or aspects of the elephant. That, that comes to the next question. So now, now you have the great data set with, with um, uh, valuable data. How do you keep this quality through the time? Uh, that, that's a big question. Uh, uh, how do you iterate with your model to uh, get to the lower quality? We see with ChatGDP sometimes when you go to a new version, you don't get the same quality on some questions. So how do you uh, give the best to, you, to your user through the time? For us, it's a difficult question. Uh, I would say it means uh, uh, because in in, um, in in healthcare, so it's very difficult to enrich again a data set. So there is the, the whole question of uh, uh, the identification of the patient, which uh, had a lot of limitation. So if we access to anonymized data, uh, you do, you can't go back to the patient ID, which means for an hospital, they will not be able to add any data. So maybe uh, with new version, you will have new questions. So we'll, you will have a new scientific information you will need uh, to explain uh, some aspect of the, of the model. If you have an anonymized data set, you can't do that. Uh, if it's a pseudonymized data set, which means uh, there is still an access to the patient information, uh, you will have to make sure you have patient consent uh, to access to this level of information and to confirm the purpose of the, the research project you're doing or of the new model you're developing is uh, accepted by the patient. So this is a, a huge limitation in healthcare, which uh, uh, means from ethical and regulatory point of view, we will need to check uh, that is feasible. So it's a lot of efforts uh, at the moment. Uh, it requires a very good understanding of uh, the law, the different type of how it's applied within Europe, within US, etc., and really uh, get the, 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 the opportunity to do that. So for us, it's a critical uh, point. On top of that, it's also accessing external data set or other data set to really validate, uh, make sure the, it's a common question, uh, the small population you have trained your model on, because most of the time they are too small for the, for the point we mentioned, will get a validation on, on others, uh, which will lead to the same type of, of question. Uh, from you validate on another data set, you will raise another question, and can you, can you train again differently? And we are in, in this loop uh, a lot of time, which means how from the beginning we try to have access to the most, uh, in terms of depth, the, the highest number of, of data, but again, for ethical question, uh, we need to get this approved. And from an ethical committee, from an ethical standpoint, it's still an open question. Uh, today, can we access to data we're not sure to use? So there is a, a question for patient. Uh, do we have to raise this question? Can we access to, to data we're not going to use? It's still a, an important point. Yeah, I, I think generally this is, um, and, and I think this relates a bit to what you say, is there's, there's a question of maturity in how we approach our models. And, and I think actually probably um, more classic models like the one you deal with are at a higher level of maturity than large language models. The way people currently approach their large language model uh, is very static. You know, it's like, oh, I get this model probably for making face, I do a quick fine tuning job on it and that's it. Uh, and then it will stay in production for one year, maybe when Lama 3 comes out, you know, I will update, but once again, I will just spend a month with my engineer working on it. So. A lot of the work we do, for instance, adapt at Adaptive ML is getting to another level of maturity where the model gets essentially continuously improved, like learning from, from every interaction that you see. And this goes with a lot of, of very classic things, actually, in the industry, like A-B testing, um, that kind of stuff, where really you measure, you know, really the impact 
uh, that as your update on, on new version of the models. And we don't see that that much in the industry, actually. I was, I was in the US a few weeks ago talking to, to a bunch of, of people using Gen AI in production, and a vast majority of people don't A-B test, for instance, which is a bit astonishing maybe to some of you, but uh, this is something that, that, that's very new. And there is a lot of work, I think, to be done in terms of, of going to, to that level of maturity where okay, our deployments are going to be more dynamic, they are going to be learning continuously, we are going to be sure that they are going the right way and not you know, the wrong way. Um, and and that's, that's, quite a, that's quite a big challenge. Where I think we are kind of lucky in all of this is that large language models are very unique uh, and probably by their size in their ability to both you know, learn from very few samples. So sometimes with just a few, you know, with like 10 demonstrations, you can radically change the behavior of a model to something new, to something you desire. And on the opposite end of that, with a million demonstrations, you can still, you know, inch out essentially more and more understanding from this million of demonstrations. And this is probably the most impressive and most unique capa capabilities of the model we are dealing with, which is they address both ends of the spectrum. Both, you know, like very efficient uh, learning from few samples and also massive learning uh, of very nuanced uh, like perceptions and from a very, very large amount of data. And, and that's, that's probably the perspective of them that, that makes them the most exciting. So how do you keep the quality, uh, you know, or maintain the quality of a data set? I think there's three components that are very important uh, when you look at the multimodality of text and image and how do you combine these two. Um, the first one is that an annotation, as we said, is key, uh, but also can get old. So and you can even see that in text too, by the way, if you were to read a newspaper from a century ago, it really reads quite differently than today and even just 30, 50 years ago. Um, and the same goes because the language evolves, uh, but also the places around you evolve. Um, so the, um, the same picture would be described differently at different times and also in different cultural places and areas of the, of the world. And so that mapping, um, you have to keep up to date. Uh, if you don't continuously do that, you grow stale in terms of uh, your descriptive power of the world. Uh, the second component is how do you keep updated live? Uh, and so that's the, the same point that Junia was saying is, especially in the media world, there's always these, well, novel things happening, right? Uh, Taylor Swift just went through one of the most successful concerts in history. Uh, that's part of what's happening today. Uh, if we were to have trained the model only you know, a year ago, this doesn't exist in the model in any form or fashion. It doesn't have the knowledge of it. It doesn't have the imagery of it. Um, so this type of things of how do you keep it up to date is also one of the reasons why uh, we're approaching this with the constitution of the Ravium uh, training data set, whereby we want to go and engage with all the actors that have access to these live uh, you know, images, media, and tell them let's continuously feed the model uh, and against of which you'll get a, a percentage of the revenues that we generate with this. Um, and so that helps us keep the model and maintain it uh, up to date and live. And I think the last one, that is important is due to the volume. Um, a lot of the systems today, for instance, Midjourney, that's uh, pretty much the preferred model out there, and they've done a fantastic job. One of the things that they've done, or uh, though you know it's not public, everybody knows, they've bootstrapped a lot of the data on things that they've trained themselves, and that is not surprising, given that we're the numbers that we're seeing today, uh, speci especially in the music, actually business, the number of AI-generated content is improving, uh, is increasing exponentially, actually faster than what the rest of the world is happening. And if you take this trend in five years, it's quite likely that most of the content in the world uh, will be AI-generated. Um, which is not a surprise, I feel, because you don't have to be restricted to what you see. Uh, you can also just imagine things and generate those. And that's one of the big ideas behind Rave, give this camera for your mind to everyone. Uh, but that also has a problem, which is if I just continuously train on the data that I have generated myself, am I not just feeding my model with uh, what it already knows? And we're already kind of seeing this, for instance, with Midjourney, where you see an image and you say, oh, that's a Midjourney image. It has kind of this style of its own. Um, how do you? Uh, keep the breadth of it? How do you keep more style coming in? How do you enlarge the model and not actually narrow it down? Uh, is an open question um, when it comes to bootstrapping on the data that you've generated yourself. So that's an important point too. I think it's worth actually bouncing up on this. Um, there is a lot of interesting stuff right now where there is this risk of mode collapse that you see sometime where a model just trained kind of in a dumb way on its own outputs will just like collapse further into this like degenerate style. But you also see the opposite trend with stuff like constitutional AI or, or RLIF, where models are also capable to self-annotate and to bootstrap themselves out of, you know, of their previous, uh, of, of what they were doing previously, like into new territories. And, 
it's kind of know, like it seems scale as a huge effect to this. Like it seems that larger models are more able to take advantage of their own annotations or to create annotations that are relevant. But it's very interesting to see where this is going because this is, you know, like um, Anthropic pushes a lot on this and it's one of the reasons Claude has, has that feel to it. Um, and it will be very interesting to see that like if we can go beyond, you know, like just degenerating and just always generating the same stuff because, you know, it will just learn from or we'll have a hard time filtering out of the web data or the image data what was generated or if we can actually use that for, for our advantage. Yes, yeah, sure. so before having AI everywhere, they were saying, uh, there is this hot topic about regulation. There was talk a lot about this morning on these points. Uh, so you have different domains, so different regulation. But uh, on health data, it's regulation have been there for a long time. How is it evolving today? Yes, so in, in France and Europe, uh, it's uh, DDPR that is applied uh, to access patient data. Uh, so as I was mentioning, to really protect the patient rights, uh, to make sure they have provided their consent, that the purpose of the way the data are used is really clear for them and that they have agreed. So they, also, they always need to have the opportunity to opt out uh, for the project. So we need to make sure of that. Uh, so that's a constant concern. Uh, I think we can say realistically today that it's slowing down a lot of a research project. So we need to, um, and I think uh, uh, from a political standpoint, a lot of efforts are doing are, are done at the moment at the European scale, but also uh, in France to try to revisit how GDPR can be better applied to healthcare and at the same time protect the patient, but still allow us to better innovate in a quicker uh, manner. So trying to um, broaden a bit, uh, a bit the spectrum of what is feasible in the benefit of patient. And I'm always saying that if you ask a patient whether or not they agree to get access to the data for research purposes, most of them, 90% of, of them accept that. So we need also to revisit uh, the way we collect consent uh, to make sure data are more easily accessible and can be, uh, can, can be accessed for, for AI models. There are a lot to, to explain, of course, to teach a patient uh, when it's done by their uh, practitioner, their clinicians, uh, that they can trust uh, when we have a, um, uh, uh, clinicians that are also uh, very open to what AI can bring in terms of uh, discovering new type of treatments. I think it works really well. Of course, there are some profile of patients that will always be against giving, even, giving access to their data, but it's, it's very few of them in the end. Yeah, I, I think on this, it's like, for um, obviously for anything related to like pre-training and all of that, I, I will skip a bit that. I think it's a, it's a subject that's very difficult. Is it fair use? Is it not? Uh, how do you, you know, how do you deal with that? And, and I'm sure actually you, you will have a very interesting perspective to bring on this. But on the last mile of data, I think this is actually where you can do like, you can be a bit like what you mentioned, you can be very user friendly essentially of like, do you want your data to be used? And I think we have a, a responsibility of clarity, like how is your data going to be used? Is my data going to be used just to make the model better for me or for multiple users and all of that? I think it's like, this is something people will, I think if we inform them, there will be a bit less of a, of a panic, you know, around oh, what, what is going on with this. Um, and typically, I think another, per, another interesting perspective on this is just the model bootstrapping themselves. Because eventually, if the model are able to provide the bulk, you know, of the annotations, we have much less to rely on essentially humans where we are unsure about their consent. You know, for the model, the consent, well, you know, it gives it. It's happy to give it. Um, so I think it's like on the last mile of data, there is right now a lot of exciting stuff that can be done in, in this regard. But for pre-training, I think it's very difficult, and especially in images, I'm sure it's especially a hot topic nowadays. Yeah, I think, Julien, you're, you're spot on here. Um, there's a couple of questions that are really important here. Well, first, um, we should not stop the speed of, of knowledge here. It's only been a year and a half since DALI 2 came out, which is kind of the first real uh, image diffusion model of you know, high quality that really has said, OK, let's change uh, it's changing the world. Um, should we really stop that uh, just within a year and a half? So probably not. And actually, some countries have already taken a position on that. So for instance, you know, in Japan and in Israel, they said, uh, if it's for research purposes, um, it is fair use. Um, now, if it's for commercial application, it changes everything. And I think that's where it's quite interesting for where we land in this landscape uh, between uh, you, Agathe, and Julien, is um, we don't have very sensitive data. When you're in the image world uh, that we're dealing with, it's entertainment, it's uh, aesthetics, it's uh, 
it's not medical, it's not sensitive, so it's not that of a much of a privacy or concern. However, it can have commercial value, right? So if you're dealing with an image of, I don't know, Beyonce, she has the rights to publicity, uh, there's her likeness, um, and so on and so forth. How do you deal with that? Now, there's two key core issues here. The first one is whether or not training a foundation model in and of itself is a fair use of, uh, you know, the way you collected the data essentially a copyright. I'm talking right now a lot about US regulation because we've worked a lot on that. Actually, we went through every single um, copyright court case in the history of US and started analyzing these and whether or not you can measure whether something has sufficient transformation or not to be or not within uh, a fair use context. And that's a very hard concept because copyright is way more different than something easy like trademark, identifiable, or you know, likeness that's very identifiable. But regardless of that, um, whether or not it's the training in and of itself is fair use or not, and it's up to the courts right now to decide, uh, there's, as you said, an approach to this that could be way more win-win, saying, hey, if we're looking for the best quality data, for the live data, uh, also annotation may be important and so on, there might be and there is now an emerging market for paying for training, even if it happened to be fair use, it may have value to have better quality data, easier to access and so on. And we've seen that already happen. So for instance, giants like Meta have gone to giants of uh, the stock media companies and say, hey, I'll pay to train on your catalog upfront, here it is. Um, there's actually, so it's a very new market. Uh, we're part of that market to some extent. Um, what does the price go to, especially if the courts end up ruling that it's zero? It's an interesting one. Uh, well, meaning, if it's fair use, is the price going to go to zero? So that's for the training. However, there's a second question that's very different, which is the outputs of the model. Now, regardless of how you do it, uh, you don't need AI, you can just Photoshop and do a collage. You can very easily create an image uh, you know, of, let's say, Beyonce, that is infringing on her rights. And so um, that is a different question than the AI question. And the, I think one of the problems that we have today is the only solutions that have been proposed really out there, or not many solutions out there, have been proposed that are constructive. What I mean is either you do an Adobe Firefly approach where you're kind of ignorant, or you forbid. So you say, hey, this is against the content policy. There is a way uh, that Apple has come out, and that's what we're doing at Rave, to kind of um, create a knowledge breadth, but that has no clear IP attribution. So you kind of anonymize at the moment of um, annotation, such that if you ask where Beyonce doesn't know that there's Beyonce, but it has actually learned the likeness of an artist and a star. Um, however, there's, how do you make a system where the artist can profit and benefit from this AI revolution, saying, actually, this is my AI, and I want to you know, publish it and start essentially making money and getting royalties out of this. I think a great example here is in the music business. There was the Drake song that came out uh, you know, about six months ago, and it really was kind of a revolution there. Um, there's no official Drake AIs yet. Uh, now there is one uh, that's being done here with uh, Grimes, for instance. I wish every artist were able to have an AI that they could publish and start making standard you know, remixes as part of culture and make money out of this in a natural and you know, friendly fashion. And that's kind of the system and the infrastructure we're building at Rave. OK, so, so we have two minutes left. So he, the, the, that I get, or, or Julien, do you want to add something on what's next on, on the data set? Do you see like something coming new? I think on Rave you are already on the future, but yeah. So I, I would say for us in healthcare, it's larger initiative that will allow us to access larger data sets in terms of number of patients uh, and worldwide initiative that can get us access to much more multimodal data sets. So uh, at Okin, we are aiming to contribute to that. So also doing our own initiative, which is called uh, Mosaic, to work with five European and North American centers to create uh, our data set and try to contribute also to that. But it has to be a joint effort with a public initiative, private one, to really accelerate uh, the creation of multimodal data set, multi-centric approach, uh, and, and also with the acceleration of uh, omic uh, uh, modalities, which are key to develop new models. You mentioned uh, LLM for healthcare, so it's the next step also, and to make sure we have specialized model with the high quality data sets. Yeah, I think we will, essentially the next step is that we will see both extreme end of the spectrum. So on the pre-training, we will see essentially accumulating pretty much ev any form of data. Like as soon as we can find ways to encode, to tokenize, uh, you know, healthcare data efficiently to have like a true joint distribution, uh, we will see that. I think we'll just like gargle up everything that we can feed into the model that, that works very well. So I think it will keep going. And on the other hand, you know, at the later stage, 
I think we will see, and it's what we are, we are doing at AdaptiveML, but we will see extreme personalization. So I think we will see, you know, with every interaction, the model will distill down knowledge down to the user level, essentially. Not just learning for everyone, but models that become hyper-specialized, that know, you know, you very in-depth, that know what you want very in-depth, uh, and that will be kind of an extension of, of you. And I think we will see really the both extreme of the spectrum being explored in, in the future generations of LLMs. So great. Thank you, everybody. I think it's time. We can talk all the day about models and data, but yeah, we have to finish and relax to the next, next panel. So uh, thank you all for the... Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next session will be uh, Guillaume Salou of Hugging Face that will be presenting on machine learning infrastructure. Uh, it will be a keynote followed by a Q&A. So uh, that will take place at 3.40. Thank you.
delivering a keynote followed by a Q&A on machine learning infrastructure is the machine learning infra lead at Hugging Face. Please welcome Guillaume Salou. Welcome, Guillaume. Hi, everybody. I'm so glad to be here today and to talk about transformers and HPC benchmarking. So we will see like two big parts today. The first part would be more about like hugging face and wha how we build like transformers. And the, more, and the second one will be more about like benchmarking HPC and the challenges between this, behind this. So before that, I would like to know more about you. Uh, um, do you know Transformers architecture? I cannot see you, but uh, yes, that's pretty cool. So I will go fast on this part, and I will take more time about like uh, the benchmarking. So let's go. So you already know that Transformer is not like the movie from Michael Bay. Uh, this image, by the way, this image has been created by a model which is called Stable Diffusion, which is available on the hub, on the space. So. Back, back in the past, what happened? First of all, a paper from Google, which is called Attention, Attention is All You Need, in 2017. So it was kind of a revolution to explain the transformer architecture and to be able to kind of have a pre-trained model and to be able to fine tune it. So it was just the beginning of like a, a new, just for me, a deep learning 2.0. So, and then one year later, they open source BERT. And BERT um, is a model that you can, as a transformer model, you can pre train it and you can fine tune. So it's kind of a revolution because you don't have to train a model from scratch. You can like, create tons of models regarding your needs. And it's, it's, it was very new in the, in the, in the area. And a little of caveat is that we have like tons of models that are, that are created, and it's some kind of the wild west of open source. So you don't know which model to use, you don't know if they have the same API, you don't have any documentation. So we were like, hmm, how can we improve it? So we started from the ground. We started with a transformer library, uh, which is well known with the form pre trained method. And here is a GitHub address if you want to have a look or just to use it. So the idea is to ease the access to the transformers model and to have some kind of unification of the models and the usage and to be able to fine tune them easily. So it wasn't enough because we had like to build a platform and we created the hub. So we will head into like uh, what what our model into the hub? So here is a model page on the left. Uh, yeah, on the left, and you can see like uh, some tags that allows you like to um, choose the right model regarding the tasks that you want to do. And if you remember what what I said about like all the models that are different, it's kind of very easy to pick the right model, but it wasn't enough. So we worked on the model card. You can see here, here it's a GPT-2. You have some kind of explanation about the model, how it was created, what, what are the metrics of the model. And at the top, you can see like all the tags. And you can see the transformer tag in order to say the compatibility with the transformer library as well. And on the right, we have like an inference API. I could like talk about it for hours, but the idea is just to easily try the model. Behind the scene, it's very complicated to have so many models that are loaded on an API. But anyway, let's move to data sets. So we saw models, and let's go to data set. If you want to fine tune a model, you need a data set you need. You can use a data set that is available on Hugging Face, or you can create your own data set. So if we have a look like maybe a little bit deeper in the data set, uh, here is an example of the data set. You can see again all the tags, and you have like 
a view, um, some kind of data set viewer in order to, to view what's inside the data set. And it's not so easy because sometimes we have millions of lines and we have some statistics about the columns and the categories and all the stuff. That's very useful when you are looking for the right data set and to pick up the right tags. I didn't say a word regarding the number of data sets, the number of models, but if you noticed in the previous slide, like in this one, yep, we only had well, like maybe uh, 1,000 point five uh, uh, data set, and right now we have 70,000 data set. And regarding the number of models, it's increasing like every day, more than 300,000 models. So. So we saw the models, we saw the data set, and we are ready to go to train a model because that's what we will do with uh, an HPC. But I will explain a little bit more during the benchmark of the, of the uh, high performance computer. So we will say that we created a model. It was very easy thanks to the transformer library. So what should I do now? It's a good question. Some people are like, ah, oh, I, will, I will deploy it. I will do some inference. But we were thinking about something else. Yeah, because it's some kind of complicated when you are like, should I deploy it? Should I, uh, I validate it? Um, and we were like, OK, let's create a demo. But I'm not like a front-end engineer, unfortunately. I'm more like a back-end engineer, I'm more like working on stacks uh, behind, the, behind the UI. So m two years ago, we acquired a company which is called Gradio. It's an open source company. You can have a look at like, uh, the link. And if you want to build like, a demo, it's very convenient to do it. Like this demo, you want to compare two models? Here we go. So. Here is just an example of like a, a sentence and to, to see the result. And behind the scene, the code is pretty easy. Uh, all the, I mean, all the lines, they are more related to some examples. And it's very easy to build in Python uh, a quick demo. So we created a demo. We are ready to go. Maybe not. Because maybe you are working with a community. Maybe you are working in a company and you want to kind of not deploy it on your laptop. You want to deploy it in the cloud. So we continue to work again, and we created spaces. I remember when I started at Hugging Face two years ago, we had like maybe 300 pods, I mean 300 spaces that were running on our infrastructure. And right now we have more than th uh, 30,000 spaces that are running, and it's it's, I mean, everything is crazy regarding all the numbers. So here is an example of some famous spaces. You can have a look, always a link. And um, what is important for us is like to abstract the complexity of things, Abst abstract the complexity of like defining what is the right model, what is the right data set, how to deploy it in the cloud. So that's why we kind of abstract the complexity with GPUs, TPUs, accelerators, HPUs, and you just have to click, and here you are ready to go to deploy your space. And it's free. If you want to like just deploy a CPU, a demo, you can do it with, I mean, nothing. So at the end of the day, when the model, when the data set, uh, the model has been created, and the demo has been validated. You are ready to go to deploy it in production. So that's why we created like inference endpoint. We were like, OK, I need to scale up, scale down, automatically scale regarding the, num the number of requests that we have. And we want it to be like one click button. You just have to pick the model. It can be a private model. It can be a public model. And you are ready to go. But it wasn't enough. So we continue to work, especially with the open source community. So we created text generation inference. We were like, OK, that's awesome. Uh, I call it TGI. But sometimes people, they want to deploy it on their own infrastructure. So again, with just one model, 
and one Docker command, you're ready to go to deploy your model. And it will abstract the complexity of the nickel stacks. And it will allow you to deploy big models on different GPUs. I mean, what, are, what is complicated currently regarding like big models? You need big GPUs with a lot of RAM. So I will talk a little bit about NCCL, which is called Nickel. So the idea is that we will shard the memory for you. Imagine that you want, like, and you need for this model, 80 gigabytes of RAM. But you don't have a GPU with 80 gigabytes of RAM. You have four GPUs with 20 gigabytes of RAM. And it will abstract you the complexity of the infrastructure behind the scene. So it's kind of pretty cool. So in the end, are we done? Um, what, what is the role of Hugging Face again? And we started to work on model, an open sourcing model. And I would like to, to introduce what we did with Bloom. So Bloom is from the Big Science Initiative. I mean, we work with the community to create some kind of foundation model. So we were like, OK, it was back three years ago we were working with the community to create the data set and to train a model. So we started to work on an HPC cluster. This HPC cluster used for this model was Jean Zé. And Jean Zé is a French HPC. So it was very good for us because we had like a good knowledge of what to do, of what not to do with an HPC, and how to train a model on HPC. So at the end of the day, we were like, hmm, that was pretty cool to train a model. I mean, what was also very, a little bit complicated when you want to, do, to train like a big model, like a Bloom, like a 170 billion of parameter model, you need to do it, uh, you need to do some distributed training. It means that we will do it on many, many GPUs, on many, many nodes at the same time but I will have more details about it uh, just a little bit later. So at the end of the day, we were like, OK, hmm, let's acquire our own HPC. And it was my mission to do it. So it was like, what is the best performance price ratio for an HPC in the world? So what I did before that, I won't explain all the results, unfortunately, because they are all under NDA. But I will explain what I did with uh, Scaleway. Yeah, on their own HPC, it's just, it's just here. So it's, it's the introduction of the HPC of Scaleway, Nabu 2023, which is a DGX superpod. And if you have a look like at, the, at the photo of the HPC, there's a lot of servers, a lot of DGX that are connected together. And what is very important when you are training large model and you are doing some distributed training is the communication between GPUs. So back to, to Nickel again. So when you are doing like a, a distributed training, you have to communicate between two iterations. You have many iterations during the training. And at each iteration, you will have all reduce. That means that all the GPUs will communicate together and to share their results. So it's some kind of a big problem because it will some kind of block, block the scalability of the cluster. So that's why on the NABU HPC, I started with an already used benchmark just to see how it will go. So here is some, ta some lines of Python. You can find it on the internet. It's not like uh, very complicated to find or reduce. And why did I do this in Python? Because you can use like some methods with Nickel, and you already have like the benchmark. But we wanted to have like the library, the environment, the Conda environment, in order to have the same condition of the training. Because sometimes when you are like launching a training, you don't have good results, and you don't know where is the problem. You're like, what, what is wrong with my training job? And sometimes it's in the environment. So 
let's go with some Python script, some environment, and we are ready to go. And what happened? Ah, I was like, well, I can show you a little bit more because I know this slide. The results are not good at all. It's supposed to be 3.2 terabytes per second. So it's lower than, uh, than anything. So I was like, hmm, what is wrong? Is it my code? Nope, because I already run it. Is it my environment? Hmm, for sure. What should I do? So I contacted NVIDIA, and they were like, oh, you are using a super pod, so you need to use containers. Like, what? And it was mandatory to use containers, so that's what I did. I started to write like a Docker file for my Python script in the end with my environment that is like uh, inside, the, inside the container. So for me, that's a good idea and a bad idea at the same time. Because when you have to build a container, it can take time. You have to push it on the registry. You have to pull it from the registry. And if you don't have like all the infrastructure, all the knowledge to do it, it can be tricky. But we did it. So, but it wasn't enough. Because I have my container. How can I run it? So I didn't explain a little bit later, but I mean, not all the HPC, but in, in, in some kind of like, or I can say all the HPC are running under Slurm. Um, so here is a Slurm job that I created for my container. On the top, you can see like some variables that are very, very important. If you don't have those variables, it won't work at all. You, you will have like bad results like I had. And what is also very important is like, like excluding some, I, some infinite band interfaces. It was very important because those ones are related to storage. Otherwise, your, your, your traffic between GPUs will be shared with the storage, and you won't have good performances. And what was also very important is here to mount the infinite band. So we have nickel, but behind the scene, we have some kind of infra in order to kind of uh, manage the network. Because having so, so many good performances, so much good performances on the network, it's a hard work, definitely. So, and what happened? It worked. And we are ready to go for the training. Because otherwise, it's my, it's my personal advice. When people are working on an HPC, you should always end GPUs and training and distributed training, you should always do this in order to know the performances, the bandwidth, the throughput of the network between GPUs. So we are ready to go for like, what, what should I do now? I need to, again, I know, uh, here are the results of the all reduce, my bad. Uh, I didn't do like all the, it's, it's, it's very important. So I will take a little bit of time to, uh, for it. It's very important to check the scalability of the all reduce. Because as you are adding more and more nodes, the throughput will be reduced as well. And as I said before, if you reduce the throughput of all reduce, you will reduce the performances of the benchmark of the training as well. So I didn't finish because I was very busy at <laughs> doing all the stuff, and I, and I needed to train my model and to see the, the number of T-flops. So that's what I did. And again, I started to containerize my code. And it's not so easy to do it, because if you remember what I did with all reduce, I was like, huh, I have like tons of libraries to import into my container as well. And one of maybe one of the most complicated ones was Apex. And so I had to manage how to do it and to work uh, around it to, to find a solution for it. But it's not the only one. Flash attention is, can, also, can also be very tricky to, to put into a container. So here we are with the container and ready to go, and we train the model. So. Here are an example of like what we see when we are training a model. 
we can see like the, the number of T flops per GPU. And what is a little bit funny is we have two types of T flop because sometimes we don't agree on the formula of T flops because it's mainly related to the number of, of tokens that the model is, is able to train. And it's more like when we want to compute the number of T-flops, we have to take the number of tokens per second per GPU, and we have to take, um, take care about the size of the model and the architecture of the model. Even if as the architecture are kind of uh, common, we are more taking care about like, the size of the model. Anyway, so back to the training, back to the benchmark. I did it on different types of uh, different types, different number of nodes. So that's what I did. Uh, we, we can see also the parameters that I used, like the data parallelism, uh, the pipeline parallelism. And I did it on 4, 8, 16, 32, 64 nodes. And you can see that the number of T-flops is some kind of decreasing, but it's okay. Because it's more like related to the fact that our GPU are communicating together. And we are adding more and more GPUs. Remember that on one node, we have eight GPUs. So when we are doubling, it's like going crazy. So at the end of the day, what is our goal regarding the benchmarking? If we want to be sure, if we, want, if we have like a, a supercomputer like the Nabu one, and if we want to use like all the nodes together, I mean the Nabu computer has 128 nodes in parallel, and we want to be sure that it's worth it. We want to be sure that it's good to scale it, because if you don't have the right network behind the GPU, you should like just wait more. And uh, just I, uh, I remember that I didn't talk about like this one. Where is it? Uh, uh, and the creating. Oh no, it's here. Uh, where is the star coder? I don't see it. Maybe I didn't push it on my. Yeah. Anyway, um, I trained the star coder. I mean, it's not like the purpose of the presentation to talk about the model that I train. Uh, but it's still interesting to talk about because we created Starcoder as we created like Bloom. It's some kind of uh, yeah the same, and the idea to propose like open source model uh, to share it with the community. And for the Starcoder, you can have a look on huggingface.co, and you will have like uh, uh, the explanation of the model. And the idea of Starcoder is to generate some code. So yeah. And what I did it to again on the on the HPC cluster because we created Starcoder once and we are working together in order to have a better model right now. So that's why I did this benchmark with Starcoder. And I already knew like the performances of the model. It's it's better to have like some kind of comparison points when you are doing some benchmarks. So anyway, I'm kind of yeah. Uh, no, it was in the wrong way. Um, just a little word to finish. Uh, it's some kind of uh, um, yeah. We are we are hiring uh, some people, so uh, it's not so easy to find the right per person, especially with our culture, our way to work. So feel free to have a look at our workable. Uh, we are hiring, and you can see like all the positions that are open. Thank you, and I'm ready for the QA. <laughs> Feel free if you have any question. Just raise, raise your, hand. your hand. Don't be shy. Oh, good yeah. job. I'm gonna come. Sorry, because we are in live streaming. Uh -huh. We will need you to talk in the mic. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for the presentation, and you got me hooked. What was uh, the performance of the of the training? Like, how did it go? Ah, what was the clue? They are good. They are good, and it's always like very complicated when we have some performances. I'm always like discussing. 
I didn't, ex yeah, uh, it was at the beginning of the presentation. I, I'm in charge of the infrastructure. I'm not in charge of the training of the job and the performances. I'm more like in charge of everything around the training. So we had like a lot of discussion with the team because sometimes they are like, it's due to the network. And sometimes I'm like, mm, maybe it's due to your parameters. And sometimes it's due to some variables that we can optimize due to the length of the message between the GPU. So, yeah, but they are good. There <laughs> Hello. Hello. Uh, OpenAI made the recent move on distribution with uh, the GPTs and the app stores. Uh, do you plan to make this kind of move? Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't uh, understand the. You know, the, the OpenAI made a move to GPTs with an app store, to with a business model to ah, to, uh, okay. to to to, dis to distribute. Uh, okay. AIs, do you plan to make this kind of move with a business model and distribution? We will still be an open source company. Uh, I mean, from the beginning of my presentation, yeah, I know that OpenAI in the beginning, they were like an open company and working on open source. But in a sense, every step that we are doing, even if we are building a product, we are building like an open source project at the same time. So. We won't stop to, to do it, even if it's, yeah, we have to take care about what people are doing with um, their models, and we are here to help. I didn't uh, talk about like many things, that, like what we are doing with companies uh, in order to help them to have, transform to have good performances with transformers. And I didn't explain what we are doing on ethics side too. Uh, so, but if I'm talking about everything, I will take too much time. Sorry. Okay, if we don't have questions. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Yeah, and feel free to, to come and to see me if you have questions, if you want to discuss. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Guillaume. Best one yet, in my opinion. <laughs> Next up, we have a panel talk on reinforcement learning. So join us again at 10 past 4. Thank you.
and welcome back to those joining us online. Next is a panel discussion on reinforcement learning for large language models. Please welcome to the stage Alexandre of InstaDeep, Jacopo of Lighton, and our moderator, my colleague Adrienne of Scaleway. Welcome. Hello. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining our panel on reinforcement learning to make LLMs as useful as possible. So before I start, we start talking about reinforcement learning, I'm going to first let both of our distinguished experts present themselves. Jacopo, do you want to start? Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacopo Poli. I'm the CTO of Leighton. Leighton is a French startup. Um, we build a platform for generative AI for large enterprises. The idea is that these co companies have two issues, privacy, and they need to be guided in using generative AI, and that's what we offer. Uh, we deploy on-premise for large companies, and then we help them use generative AI in their wor workflows. Thanks, Jacopo. And now, Alexandre? Well, thanks for having me first, so thanks. I'm happy to contribute to this, this great event. So I'm Alex. I'm, the, I'm leading the research team of InstaDeep, so we are a startup specialize in, let's say, innovation and, and applied research. So with a specific focus on reinforcement learning. So we're helping our customer build custom solution for them. Uh, for example, in fields such as transportation, logistic, uh, supply chain. Uh, we work with, for example, actors like Deutsche Bahn in Germany to help them build um, and manage the dispatching of trains over there. So all the solutions are very advanced. So we need a kind of strong research team and research arm in the company. So that's what I'm leading. The company is around 350 people, um, and the research team is around 40. So the focus of our team is uh, twofold. The first one is on decision-making AI, where we do a lot of reinforcement learning, like I mentioned. But also, and more recently, in the last two years, we have developed a lot of expertise in machine learning for biology, um, especially due to our long collaboration with BioNTech. So I think you all heard of, of BioNTech, because they were the first to successful, successfully deliver um, a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Uh, and, and spread it to the world. Um, and so we've been working with them for the last three years and they just recently acquired us uh, in July of this year. So we're very excited about that and we're gonna, let's try to empower them in their mission of personalized vaccine uh, for, for the world. So we're very excited about that and we keep also obviously working with all our customers and developing products for them. Thanks, Alexandre. Yes. So why are we talking about reinforcement learning today? Um, well, to start with, uh, in the benchmark conducted by uh, Berkeley on the top LLMs, the top three incorporate reinforcement learning. And why is that? It's because I think all of you who are working on models know the challenges with predictability of responses, with how uh, the model drifts, and how do we make sure that it responds correctly in the best way, reduce the number of hallucinations, and so how do we build feedback loops so the model continues to learn about um, how to respond in an optimal way. Um, so we're gonna talk about what is reinforcement learning uh, in a bit more detail. We're gonna talk about the technical challenges of reinforcement learning. And then, not just technical challenges, there are also business challenges uh, around reinforcement learning, which uh, means that uh, a number of people are looking at alternatives uh, in terms of honing models uh, to these kinds of uh, technologies. Um, we are going to look at forward thinking, what are the future trends in reinforcement learning, and then I will hand over to uh, both of our speakers for some special uh, announcements. So let's start with what is reinforcement learning? Alexandre, can you tell us? Yeah, of course. <laughs> so first things first, yes. Yeah. So Errol, I like to say that reinforcement learning is about, is the problem of controlling an unknown system. So that doesn't mean much. So if, if you try to be a bit more concrete, Reinforcement learning try to train an agent to solve sequential decision-making problems, right? So if you take the classic analogy of playing chess, for instance, you have an AI agent playing against itself, it generates um, games, and it plays, it plays move and change the configuration of the ball step by step. At the end, the agent receives a reward signal, which is either, for example, plus one if it's a win, minus one for a loss, and uh, zero for a draw, for instance. And then over time, you hope that the agent will start um, identifying patterns such that some patterns yield mostly a win uh, or a loss or a draw. And it's gonna start reinforcement, reinforcing those patterns 
to, at the end of the day, try to reach an optimal behavior. So it's, um, we use a lot of games in reinforcement learning because it's, they are very easy to simulate um, and also the scoring function is very transparent. But reinforcement learning is, is a very versatile approach, right? It can be used on so many things. We use it at Instadeep for, like I mentioned, supply chain, transportation, logistics. So it's very versatile. There has been a lot of success stories of RL, uh, mostly by big tech companies. So for example, OpenAI use RL for, to control robotic hands. Uh, Google Brain or Google X, I believe, use RL to control stratospheric balloon such that they can control uh, the location such that they can provide um, internet uh, connectivity to some remote location on the globe. Um, and then more recently, perhaps, uh, we could say that RL was also useful to make and, and contributed to make, for example, ChatGPT as uh, successful, right? So I say contributed because obviously RL is not, um, is not all, right? There's a, a, let's say, complicated pipeline here to reach uh, the quality of ChatGPT. So obviously we know there is the whole part about um, the, the learning the base model and doing a lot of uh, next token prediction on those models on a large quantity of data, perhaps of low quality, but large quantity at kind of internal scale. And at the end of the day, you end up with a model that can do text completion very well, but it's not super useful. Then generally people do a, a next step, which is um, supervised fine tuning, where they show a few amounts, so we're definitely in a low uh, quantity uh, regime, but very high quality of demonstration of how you would like your um, LLM to behave. How do you want your LLM to answer a prompt from the user? So that's already make the model quite useful, but not quite yet, right? So we, we change the style of the answer of LLM to respect what you expect the LLM to answer to a given prompt, but still, it, it's, not, it's still not super useful for a user, and that's why there's this last stage of using reinforcement learning to kind of align the model with what you would like it to, how you would like it to behave. And there, when you try to apply reinforcements for LLM, and that's what we call RLHF, it's a two-step process. The first step is, obviously, you have a pre-trained LLM, and you're going to start asking human evaluators to rank the solution or generated by LLM given a certain prompt. Based on this ranking, what you're going to do first is train a reward model. So you reinforcement learning need this reward signal, this kind of feedback loop, as mentioned by Adrian, uh, to be able to shape its behavior, reinforce good behavior that yield high reward. So the first thing to do is training a reward model. Based on that, now you're going to have an agent that's capable of evaluating, of assessing whether a given answer um, is, let's say, is going to be evaluated uh, correctly by, by the human, by the human um, evaluator. So you want, you want to maximize, let's say, the probability for human evaluator to agree with, with this answer. Once this is done, you can actually use reinforcement learning against this reward model. So you can simply use, uh, like OpenAI used the proximal policy optimization method because they invented them, um, but you can use other error algorithms as well. So you try to use reinforcement against this reward model to kind of slightly improve the capacity of your model to answer in a more appropriate way to the different prompts of the, um, that the user would provide. So, so that's the first thing, but of course you can also try to reiterate that process over and over again. Because when you, you, you don't want to over-optimize your model, because the rewards model might not be uh, super accurate everywhere. It's generally accurate over distribution of uh, answer your model can provide, but if you start changing your model, obviously you change the distribution here. So you want to avoid over-optimization, and how do you do that? You can, once you have uh, fine-tune slightly your, your model, you can ask again to the human evaluator to provide more feedback uh, to fine-tune your reward model, and again, we apply reinforcement learning. So it's kind of a tedious process, uh, for sure, um, but at the end of the day, that's what works better, right? As Adrian mentioned, in the top AI assistant in the world right now, so you have ChatGPT, Claude, and others, um, all of them have been, let's say, the final stage of the training has been a relative, so it works very well in practice, um, because obviously it's try to align a bit more um, the output of the LLM with, with the human evaluators. So yeah, in a, perhaps in a long, uh, long form, this is, this is RL and also how it's being used for, uh, for LLM at, at this stage. Thank you, Alexandre. Um, so let's get into the technical difficulties or challenges of implementing these types of technologies. Um, Jacopo, do you want to talk about these a bit? Yeah, sure. 
so at Layton, in production for our customers, we, we use a model that's trained with RLHF. Uh, in order to do this, there are different challenges to address. Um, the first one is obvious. It's a technical challenge in terms of uh, how to actually train the model. It's quite different from pre-training. Uh, pre-training is, in the end, expensive but simple. You collect a massive amount of data, you initialize a super large model, and you just let it run. Provided you have a few hyperparameters set right, it's going to work. In RLHF, we have to juggle three models. These models, uh, they are active in different parts of the process. Um, and you might have models that have different size. The reward model could be smaller, larger. There are people who do both. We do larger model for reward model, because we think it's better. Uh, if you have a larger model, then you need to juggle the fact that that might not fit in the same node that you're using for the model that you're actually training on. Um, all these kind of considerations mean that you have to, uh, you essentially you add a dimension to the complexity of the parallelism that you have to implement in pre-training. In pre-training, you just have one model, you parallelize it um, across three different dimensions, typically. Here, you also have to take into consideration that when you switch model, you have memory. Uh, constraints that are a bit different. And on top of this, um, there is also the question of data. The thing that's a bit annoying about the free top models is that they're trained on data that's not disclosed. And this is actually the massive, uh, the massive thing that makes this model have tremendous value. Um, the thing is, Models that are really capable, they're also much more capable in picking up biases in the data. And I'll make two examples to, to make you understand this. Uh, one of the um, examples that people do to teach how RLHF works is let's train a, a policy with a sentiment classification reward model. So we want a model that always outputs positive sentiment. If we do this in a really naive way, we are going to have a model that learns to output probably a lot of times the token great, 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 because that's really positive. <laughs> but it's not what we actually want. And something that's even subtler that we've actually experienced in Open Assistant, which is one of the best quality uh, data sets for RLHF uh, in, in the open, in our experience, there are a lot of data in Spanish. And the data in Spanish are of really good quality. And then there are data in English that have a more even distribution of quality. If we don't balance the data, what we get in practice is that if we prompt the model with hello, the model will actually reply in Spanish. Because during the training, we didn't address this bias. And the model, like the reward model, saw this data and said, OK, when I output stuff in Spanish, it's great. So let's output stuff in Spanish which, once again, it's not what we really want. Um, so there are plenty of things like this that are really subtle and that often we only discover once we've trained the model because even really subtle biases in the data then show up in an incredibly uh, visible way when we actually use the model in practice. Um, and the quality of data in the open, yes, there is Open Assistant. There are some other data sets. There aren't that many preference data sets. And the ones that are there, most of them also have feedback that's not actually human. Uh, that's GPT-4 or a system like that, that actually provided feedback. And in some ways, it's OK. But then we have to also think that those models have been trained, and they might have biases as well. So they will uh, have an effect. On, uh, on the data that they generate. And also, um, in terms of the actual personality of the model, we can see when a model is trained on data that's like OpenAI, because they will do like the typical stuff that the open source community has learned to dislike, uh, where they say, as an AI language model, I will not do this and that. So that there are all these kind of considerations to take into account. Besides the technical challenges, it's complex engineering. Uh, it needs quite some effort to implement. Uh, the data work is undervalued. And it's really, really important, because the model is unusable if you don't, don't take care of that part. Thanks, Jacopo. Uh, Alexandre, maybe you had a, kind of some other aspects of technical difficulties in specific industries like uh, biology for RL? Yeah, I mean, we, 
we use Everlechef less in the context of AI system, like Jacopo just described, but we use it a bit more for biology. So when you think about, for example, doing drug design or antibody design, uh, what you might have is, a, let's say, a language model that can generate candidate sequences of, for example, amino acids, um, which is a candidate for, for drug design. And then um, what you would do then is you, have, you would test in vitro, uh, in a wet lab, this candidate and get a feedback. But that takes a huge amount of time. So that's, there's an uncompressible amount of time you have to spend to wait to get the feedback from the experiment. Um, and there, again, there's a very large amount of noise. Depending on the calibration of the machine, depending on the scientists who, who perform the experiment, you might have a very large amount of noise. And so how do you do RLHF or let's call it RLBF, like from biological feedback, how do you do that efficiently in that context? That requires, again, other type of techniques, perhaps, um, you also probably want to, you know you're going to have multiple rounds of feedback you're going to collect, so you probably want to maximize the information gain at each, at each iteration, as opposed to trying to get the best candidate from the get-go. You want to maximize the amount of information you get, such that you can, uh, let's say, bring a lot of value and knowledge to your model uh, for the next stage. Right? So, uh, again, depending on the context in which you apply your LHF, other challenges arise, um, and that makes it quite interesting. Thanks, Alexandre. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little anecdote I heard today about uh, reinforcement learning. Uh, so uh, somebody was telling me that uh, LexisNexis, which is a very big uh, database of um, legal documents in the United States, trained a model to uh, find uh, legal questions on their, all their documents, and they announced 0% hallucination. So, of course, that's an interesting stat. And so uh, the, the person who told me the story said, I, he asked them, like, how did you do that? Uh, what level of reinforcement learning did you do? And so they said, well, we had 4,000 lawyers for a whole year who were testing the model. And so I think what's interesting with this question is now, now that we've talked about the technical difficulties are what are the business challenges of doing reinforcement learning? Is there a law of diminishing returns? You're putting a huge amount of effort in computing in people to get maybe incremental improvements of your model. Uh, and so how, how uh, do you deal with that type of challenge, Jacopo? Yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting question. A lot of people come to us and say, I, I'm, like, I'm using ChatGPT, it's incredible. I want the same thing for my company. Uh, I just want it on my infrastructure. And we are, okay, we are the guys for you. Um, but how to go from this to actually deploying in practice? A lot of times these people have used the tool uh, just in a generic way. Um, the reason why OpenAI models are so great is that the model is treated like a product. And that means that every behavior of the model is designed. Like the fact that when we ask certain kinds of questions, we have a specific answer is really designed by the people who are creating this model. If you take any open source model and you go with a prompt that's like banana, you will have nonsense in the output. If you go to GPT-4 or GPT-3.5, you will probably have a funny answer, like, okay, bananas and make a joke about it and go on with the thing. And this is dumb, but for people that are outside uh, of the technical field, it's really a game changer because it allows them to understand and interact with the system much more simply. So in terms of business challenge, the, the real challenge is actually define with our customers uh, how should the system behave. And the other thing, for example, is they are tools that are very cultural, like the way GPT-4 speaks, you can see it, it's American. It's not the same way that French people speak or people in the Middle East speak or Chinese people speak. And this thing at some point gives a certain sense of uh, feeling just not right. Like it's, it's really good, but it's just missing that last uh, percent that makes it really sound like something human. Um, so this is actually what people, like, if we focus on with our customers, uh, it's like definition of the behavior of the model, and from there then we can work to deliver what they want. So in a way that, that incremental improvement is worth it because it generates business. Yeah, the exactly. Product. Then there is the question of the like, trade-off between spending so much time defining like the perfect system, which does not exist, and instead uh, uh, defining precise deliverables that we can act on and we can measure, but this is just, I mean, normal, uh, good, uh, let's say, product design practice. 
Um, so we talked about the technical difficulties uh, of RL. Um, what type of alternatives are there to HODE models, Alexandre? So, I mean, w indeed, like, RL is, is let's say, um, RLHF is a tricky pipeline to implement, so there's this two-step process that you have to iterate multiple times, getting the reward model right, and then optimizing using RL, but not over-optimizing, and so on. So it is very tedious um, and probably uh, quite expensive to do. So quite naturally, people have tried to move away uh, from RL um, and RLHF. And there have been some, some recent, let's say, success story there, uh, notably some papers around uh, direct preference optimization. Um, there, they remove, they remove the need of this two-step process by uh, instead of doing reward modeling and then optimization, they would directly do a regression task due to the fact that you can reparameterize your reward according to the policy of the agent. So you can directly optimize the policy such that you respect the ranking provided by the, um, by the human evaluators. So that's very promising. Um, I haven't tried myself, but it looks like a very simple approach that seems very efficient when you read the paper. So really looking to see how people are going to use that. I think it's quite, um, it's quite amazing how fast the, the field is going. When you see that ChatGPT was released one year ago, RLHF really become very kind of, a, uh, kind of a thing on its own because of that. And now, a few months later, or a year later, perhaps, we have found a new method that's uh, most likely going to overseed uh, RLHF. Really um, obviously, having a reward model is interesting also for other aspects. Perhaps you want to do rejection sampling, do a lot of sampling uh, to ensure a given prompt and use your reward model to rank the sensors and take the best one. So uh, having a reward model can still be useful for some aspect, but I think instead of trying to develop this very expensive pipeline doing RLHF, probably the first thing to try is this kind of new simplified approach that seems to work very well. And then perhaps it still doesn't satisfy your need, then you can go for the full RLHF approach because it still has its benefits, right? Thank you. Um, quick question uh, on something you mentioned, uh, Jacopo, earlier, is how the open source community uh, reacts to uh, RL uh, and the challenges there. Yeah, let's say that in the open source community there is a, a part of it that doesn't like it because of the way it's used, typically. Uh, and it was not uncommon uh, on Twitter, at least uh, like until uh, one month ago or so, to see people like, I hate RLHF because it's like, it's mainly used for safety purposes uh, by large companies, and understandably because they are liable for what they do. Uh, while in the open source community, like, we can be a little more, bit more free. Um, in reality, in our experience, RLHF is so much more powerful than supervised fine tuning. The generalization capabilities that we get from RLHF, from very few samples, are insane. They are totally different from what we get from supervised fine tuning. Thank you. Um, so, Alexandre, you're in charge of research. So, can you tell us a little bit about what you see uh, the future of RL uh, is shaping to be? What are the latest trends or the upcoming trends? Yeah, yeah for sure. I mean, I can talk also with respect to what we do at Institute. So, there is Definitely one trend, especially in biology, where we use, let's say, LLMs, large language models for genomics, proteomics, and, and so on. There's been this amazing work by DeepMind around AlphaFold and the like, and that really started uh, a lot of initiative in that space. So even though it's not LLM-like in, in, in the context of NLP, uh, you still can use generative AI quite a lot in the, in the biotech industry. So that's what we're doing a lot at InstaDeep around genomics. We release actually on Hugging Face. So Thanks a lot to the Hugging Face folks for making this platform. It's very easy to share to share our model there. Uh, we have, the, for example, the state of the art for large workers models in genomics. So we do a lot of work there, and there's this, the whole work about multiomics and others that is that is just very interesting. But then more on the classic way of using LLMs and generative AI, I would say the most interesting aspect that I find fascinating is the use of tools with LLMs. I believe that empowering LLMs by using some, some tools or even other models is, is amazingly powerful. Uh, I think just last week there was this model called Lava, uh, Lava Plus or something like this, uh, where uh, the team of researchers actually allowed the, um, the LLMs to call other LLMs. So, for example, they use the segment anything model from uh, Facebook, from Meta now, um, and you actually have the LLM that is able to call uh, another LLM to do the segmentation of an image and then be able to use that result 
uh, for the let's say the, the reasoning of the LLM and, and ground a bit more the answer. So that's amazingly powerful. I'm still a bit frustrated from a just pure research point of view and, and the aesthetic of the solutions that um, these LLMs are being trained to use other tools using supervised learning. So you would give, either you do in-context learning where you provide example, perhaps a description of the tools and you would hope that your LLM is gonna somehow understand how to use that tools, uh, but that's kind of brittle. And then you also have the other approach of giving demonstration, but perhaps fine tuning your LLMs uh, to learn how to use that tool. But again, there, um, it's kind of tedious to have to retrain LLM to learn how to use tools. Uh, we know that training them is not necessarily easy, even with uh, parameter efficient uh, fine tuning. So that can be a bit tedious. And also, like I mentioned, the aesthetic of that solution for me is it's not great. I would much rather try to use reinforcement learning to try to give the model this notion of task and I give you tools and you have to learn automatically how to use them to accomplish some task. And for now, that's not something that has been done. Everyone uses supervised learning and demonstration. I think it has a huge potential using ARL in that context. It's actually something we had done, like I think five years ago, we, we published a paper with Google DeepMind called Alpha NPI where we show how it was an LSTM back then, of course, um, how an LSTM could have called and composed sub-programs automatically to accomplish some kind of more complicated task. And all the sub-programs were learned. Everything the human had to do was simply to define the pre and post condition um, of each program. But the, the system would learn uh, to, to solve each task automatically. So that's why I, I, I believe it's possible. Uh, to train LLM using reinforcement and to use tools as opposed to simply supervised learning. So that's what I'm very excited about and I think that's going to be quite empowering for LLMs and that's going to change quite a lot. So um, just to kind of uh, wrap up our, um, our panel, so talking about what's exciting you right now, that's what's your, what you're working on and uh, yeah. Yeah. how Insideep is... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's very much aligned with that. Um, I believe we, we did some a lot of work on also using Having multiple LLMs debating, we know hallucination is uh, is a big topic right now. How can we help uh, in terms of uh, truth discovery? How can we make multiple Asian debates such that you uh, remove the display of hallucination, or at least you alleviate it quite quite a bit? Um, and it's also it, it, it's quite interesting there. Um, you can see that by the level of by modulating the level of agreeableness between the different models, uh, you can see that you can actually improve quite a lot of the performances. So we, we're working a lot on trying to articulate LLMs among each other and also start using other tools. So that's really something we're pushing strongly on. Thank you, Alexandre. And so to finish, uh, Jacopo, I think you had some things to announce today. Yes, uh, so at Layton, we believe in, in an open core strategy. So our models, like the model that we deploy to, to our customers, are actually open source. We're releasing a version two of the model that's trained with an increased context length with respect to the first one, that's like 8K context length. And in the next weeks, we're gonna release the reward model and the RLHF version as well at 8K. And they're available on a game face on Apache license. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Jacopo. Uh, well, that concludes our panel for today. Thanks, everyone, for listening to us. Uh, and I'm sure uh, our two experts will be happy to answer questions outside. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandre, Jacopo, and Adrienne, of course. Uh, at 4.50, we will have uh, Arthur Mensch of Mistral AI joining us to talk open source. So join us again at 4.50. Thank you.
Hello. Here to talk open source with us and perhaps if there is time take a couple of questions at the end of the session is the co-founder and CEO of Mistral AI, Arthur Mensch. Welcome Arthur. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so I'm the CEO of Mistral AI, and I'm here to uh, guess, give an overview of what we've been doing the last six months. Uh, there won't be a lot of announcement uh, this uh, today because we we announce when we announce. But uh, we'll um, I'll give an overview of what we've been doing. Uh, talk to you about what we are trying to achieve in terms of uh, business development, in terms of technology as well. Uh, the way we've chosen to distribute the technology, which is uh, slightly different from uh, what others have been proposing the last few years. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll be happy to have an open discussion uh, after that because I think I have 30 minutes and I probably will be faster than that. So let's see. Um, so our ambition at Mistral AI, which is a company that we started with uh, Guillaume and Timothée, uh, my co-founders uh, in May, uh, is to develop frontier models, uh, develop the foundational models that, that are behind the AI revolution that we are seeing today, uh, and put them in the hand of uh, real-world application makers. So it's not that easy to take a model and to make a low-latency application that serves a purpose, and this is really what we want to make happen. Um, we think that the one public to talk to uh, in doing that is really the developers, uh, are really the developers. We see in France, we see in Europe, a very large ecosystem of AI builders uh, that would definitely benefit from having deeper access to AI models, and this is uh, our intention. That was our intention when we started the company. It, so that's the, um, that was the premise of uh, starting Mistral AI. We, another premise which is very important and cr critical to our DNA is the fact that if you want to talk to developers, if you want to um, enable them to create uh, differentiated applications, you do, give, you do need to give them deep access. And the best way to give deep access to a technology is to do it uh, by releasing open weight models and open source software. We think uh, that this is the correct way of accelerating the technology adoption. And this is what we started doing with our first release that we did uh, at the end of September. That's, I guess, the first premise, which is really the second line here, but I'm realizing that I haven't rehearsed this talk. Um, the training, uh, another premise of our start, uh, is that generative AI can actually be trained uh, much more efficiently than what we've been observing uh, in very large companies. Uh, we've shown that with a very tiny fraction of the compute of our previous employers, uh, we could train models that were competitive and useful for a large variety of tasks. And this is what we started doing, and this is what we will be continuing doing. Um, as I've said, open source is the way to make AI useful. Uh, open source is useful because you can give deep access to models. Having access to model weights is the way of tweaking them to pour one editorial choices, to pour some, some demonstrations, to pour some reward modeling into the models uh, that you have at hand. And this is the way you actually create differentiated applications, much more than if you were to use only closed source APIs that you can't really understand. So that's the premises of where, how we started. Um, we now have a team of 18 people, uh, 19, 20, uh, growing. Uh, and we, we started very, very quickly. Uh, early June, uh, we had five people joining the first day, and the first thing we did was basically recreate the entire stack that is needed to train models. The stack needed to train large language models is data pipelines, training code, uh, leveraging uh, existing clusters uh, that are actually always, ta always take some time to uh, get a hold on them. Uh, we recreated the world evaluation pipeline from scratch, the inference code as well that we are now shipping to our customers. So that took some time. These were things that we knew how to do because we, we had some experience in that field, but uh, uh, it was still quite a daunting task this summer to recreate it. 
And we've been doing that. We've been using GPUs as they arrived. Uh, Jensen was here uh, this, uh, this morning, as you all know. Uh, getting access to GPUs is, is not that easy. And so we got them like every week. We had a few GPUs coming, and we were, we were just plugging them uh, onto our cluster and increasing the speed of our training runs. So Mistral 7B that we released at the end of September is a model that has 7 billion parameters. Um, so which means that it's actually small enough to run on a smartphone. Uh, we haven't been doing it, but the community has been adopting it to make it run on iPhone 15 uh, at a reading speed, which is great. Um, and what we've shown with Mistral 7B is that there was still a lot of leeway uh, in making small language models. The open source best models at the time was Llama 2. And as you can see here, the 7B model we made is actually beating Llama 2 13B, so almost two times bigger, uh, on all benchmarks. And that was our target since, um, yeah, we, the target was from day one to do that. Um, I was uh, and Timothée and Guillaume uh, were uh, pioneers in some of the technology uh, uh, for large language models. Uh, in particular, we have a very good understanding of scaling laws. And scaling laws tell you how you basically predict uh, the performance of models based on the amount of compute you put and the size of the model. And so our understanding of these things allowed us to figure out that we could make a model much smaller than what was existing. And so we really targeted this, this size, which is useful for developers because, as I've said, you can run it on iPhone, but you can also run it on MacBook Pros. And it's super easy to have a local deployment of Mistral 7B. And so it's super easy, but still it's useful because it's the capacity of Llama 213B, and if you fine-tune it uh, with instruction data, you can get something, you can get a model which is already a pretty good chatbot. Uh, and so we've been seeing a lot of traction around that, and I think this can be imputed to several things. The first thing is that we made it 8-page 2.0, which is uh, a standard open source license, and that allowed every company to take it and to integrate it uh, as part of their AI pipeline. The second thing is that it was small enough to be used uh, locally, and it was small enough to be used on very old GPUs that turned out to be the only one available. And it was good enough to be useful. So when you use it as a chatbot, it can be, an it can be quite entertaining. Uh, when you use it for summarization, when you use it for like, intermediary tasks that the end user may not see, but that are actually critical uh, to the AI chains that are, uh, on which AI applications rely, well, they're very low latency and they're very low cost. And so uh, we've, we have a few companies that have been adopting it uh, to replace some existing more expensive and more opaque APAs. If you look at, uh, so these are basically what we call scaling laws. Um, on the x-axis, you have the model size. And on the y-axis, you have some form of representation of performance. And usually, these things look more or less like uh, you, you you work on making them uh, look like uh, a line, so that it's more almost a line there. And you have some form of relationship between the model size, the compute size, the, uh, and the performance. And what you see here is that if we plot the Llama 2, uh, which was the best open source fa model family at the time, if you plot this performance to size, you do see that we're much above. Uh, we are above, and you can make some form of extrapolation of the equivalent llama size, uh, which is in between 13 to 25b, depending on the on the benchmark. So really, that tells I think the world that there's still a lot of things to be done to make very small models, and this is I think something that uh, people are not realizing. So we will be seeing smaller models uh, in 2024, and I believe that we play the part in it. Another thing that we focused on is to try to make the models uh, very efficient at inference. And one thing that is interesting uh, when you look at what are the bottlenecks uh, when you serve a large language models, a large language model is that oftentimes this is not compute, this is rather memory. So if you have a latency critical workload, uh, you are going to be bounded by the amount of memory you have on a GPU. And what takes memory? Uh, 
on the GPU when uh, you serve a large language model, where you have two things. You have the first thing is our parameters, but parameters are really 7 billion, 3.5 billion if you quantize them to info. So this doesn't take a lot of memory. What really takes memory is what we call the KV cache, so the key values uh, that you need to store when you do the attention, ma uh, the attention mapping. And this is really the thing that has the highest memory pressure. And as it turns out, when you increase the context length, which is what your model can see in order to reason about it, well, the memory pressure increases linearly with uh, the, the context size. And that's because when, by definition, the transformer, uh, each, every token in the transformer attends to every previous token in the vanilla version. And that means that you need to keep every token in memory to continue sampling new tokens. And how do we solve that? Uh, we've proposed a new architecture, which is actually not a new architecture, but we revived some old architectures from the previous uh, 20, from something from 2019 called Longformer. And what it is doing is the following. So instead of having a model attending the 16K tokens that came before, you have every token only attend the previous 4K tokens. And in doing that, you, you still have a very large context length because you have information spreading across depth. This is the, the, um, the picture you see on the right. Uh, you, you have some form of information that spreads across depth, very similar actually to uh, convolutional neural, neural networks. Uh, you have some form of um, uh, effective attention. And the good thing about that is that instead of having your key values stored, the 16K key values stored, you always keep 4K key value store. So you've basically reduced by four times the memory pressure. And when you're considering workloads that involve, that are memory bound, so that are blocked by the amount of memory you have to dedicate on your GPUs, well, you've just made it four times cheaper. So this is one of the things that makes uh, Mistral 7B also interesting. It's small, but it also has small memory pressure. It's the first step. There's still many things to be done to try to reduce this memory pressure. The, the KV cache is, I think, one of the most outstanding problems in the generative AI space. We do use too much memory uh, to serve models. So that's something that uh, we made a first step to improve. So what does Mistral 7B do? Um, we've, uh, we've, we dedicated uh, a lot of engineers uh, to actually make it available everywhere. So it's now available on the free large hyperscalers. It will soon be available on Scaleway. Um, it's used by many uh, companies uh, as a replacement of uh, OpenAI APIs. Um, it's, and I think for us, the most rewarding part is that it's been used in many open source projects, also as a drop-in replacement for closed source uh, models. The good thing with open source projects that built themselves on top of proprietary APIs is that now if you move on to a model which is fully a page 2.0, uh, you now have a fully open source stack, so that which creates a full independence uh, from uh, proprietary solutions. And we believe that in many cases, and in particular uh, for applications led by governments, for applications led by regulated industry, this independence is going to be critical for productionization. And so that's really something that, uh, that we've started to enable. So it, um, it empowers open source projects, uh, it empowers commercial applications. There's it's been also uh, very interesting derivative work uh, that are enabled by the fact that the, the license is super permissive. And so Mistral 7B runs on your phone. Uh, this is a picture that uh, uh, someone sent me uh, on, uh, I think, two, yeah, two, two days ago. Apparently, it only works on iPhone 15 uh, to, be, to be continued, but we expect that such model size is going to be available on smartphones. And what it means is that it's private by design because it runs locally, so it doesn't go to, to, to the cloud. So it also runs on your MacBook, especially if it's a MacBook Pro. Uh, it runs at very high speed. It runs at 25 tokens per second. Uh, which is great because you can't read at that speed. So uh, that's the, something that has been quite exciting for us. Um, we've seen very interesting derivative work. So if you have access to the base model that we released, you can actually take new data sets, uh, use new techniques to, to uh, upcycle the model and modify it to make it better. 
And that was really our intention, releasing the base model to have a community of people that would uh, contribute new ideas, new data sets, uh, new paradigms to make the model better and to build new capabilities. Uh, so good examples are uh, there's three of them. Uh, one of them was built by uh, our friends at Hugging Face. Uh, so they took our model and used some new techniques revolving around uh, direct preference optimization to make a model called currently Zephyr 7B beta, uh, if it's still in beta. Um, and this actually is currently the best instructed model out there uh, of 7B. Uh, our instructed model was, was good, but uh, very soon uh, Zephyr made a better version. So it's great because we believe that fine tuning is something that can be led by the community because it's not something that is compute intensive. So it's really, it calls for a lot of creativity and creativity uh, comes oftentimes from large crowd. We've seen also new uh, capabilities, so longer sequence length. Uh, there's um, a model called the Armistral 7B 128K, uh, which, as its name uh, announces, uh, has a 128K sequence length, uh, which is great because you can read most of uh, books with, with this sequence length. Uh, and once again, these were made by, uh, by uh, like um, open source projects uh, very with very strong people. Uh, something quite fun is that there's also a version called Mistral Trig Mistrus 7B uh, that has occult capabilities. Uh, so it can talk about different things related to ghosts and people coming out of the from the dead. And, and as it turns out, the base model wouldn't do that pretty well, but this one does it very well. Uh, so once again, a very nice collaboration. Um, so that's, the, that's Mistral 7B. Uh, what's ahead? Nothing to announce, obviously. Uh, we will have some new open source models, obviously. Uh, we're currently working on Scaleway uh, Superpod, which is working great. Uh, there's new science. We started, we are scientists. Uh, all of the team is made of scientist people. Uh, there's much to discover, as I've said. Uh, new paradigms to invent, better reasoning, uh, better memory capacity, better efficiency in training, many things to be built. Um, there's, uh, on the business side, we're working on a hosted solution. We're working on self-deployed platform. This is something that is already available on our website. We're working on better things. Um, and obviously, we're working on optimized, verticalized models. So the roadmap is pretty packed uh, for next year. Um, I think I basically did 17 minutes, so we can have some pretty long Q&A. Uh, another thing is that uh, the team is growing. Uh, we're actually re recruiting people on the AI side, so really the life scientists of, uh, of computer science, uh, so people that would run experiments and make them better uh, with various iterations. We do have a lot of compute to offer. Uh, we're also recruiting uh, engineers uh, for our platform work. Uh, we're recruiting in the business side uh, because we need to talk to a lot of enterprises that have been reaching out and we are currently at capacity. Uh, so if you have uh, one of these intentions, feel free to reach out and uh, we'll be in touch. Um, I'm happy to take any kind of questions uh, and thank you for your attention. Bonjour Arthur, David Berebi, groupe Prisma Media Vivendi. Comment est Mistral avec la langue française Alors Mistral, c est, c est, I should probably speak in English. Uh, Mistral 7B is, uh, was trained on English only, so it's very good at English. Uh, we have made a lot of progress on the multilingual capabilities recently. So we do have some very strong multilingual models. Uh, this is all based on what data you train it on, uh, and we've done a lot of progress on that. Obviously, we are very keen to have models that speak French. Euh, bonjour, Laurence Benamou, Agence France Presse. J'ai lu dans la presse américaine et dans le Financial Times que vous, allez, vous êtes en train de lever 400 millions d'euros. Est-ce que c'est vrai no, We never comment fundraising issues. Hey Arthur, my name is Nico from TFS, nice to see you here. You set up there that um, with the help of Scaleway, 
uh, you're planning on, on, on training and deploying new open source models. And if I heard well, the CEO of Scaleway this morning, he echoed that uh, announcement talking about, yeah, but I was not clear. Can you say a little bit more as to what's coming down the line after the 7B? And what you're training, even if you're not releasing? Um, yeah, we'll have things coming up. Uh, obviously, we are not going to, st to stop at, uh, at the small model size. Uh, and we currently, yeah, we are using uh, Scaleway SuperPod currently, and that's working very well. Hello Arthur, thank you very much and thank you so much for what you did for the community. Uh, my question is more about you. What's keeping you up at night and how can we help you as a community to bring Mistral, to make Mistral stronger and better? So I sleep very well, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's no, no issues there. Uh, I think we're really uh, welcoming any kind of uh, community contribution. Uh, derivative work is a great way of, uh, of doing things, coming up with new data sets, new ideas, creative ideas. I mentioned this occult work, but, uh, which is quite fun, but uh, if you have access to a data set which is fun, uh, which is potentially unique to you, you can create a fun chatbot. So uh, I think something that we've been missing out uh, in, that, uh, well, in that field, uh, especially the last year, is that everything was very serious. Uh, really, we're talking about generator of text. You can make very interesting, creative things. So uh, that's something that we are very welcoming. Uh, that's something that we will be actively encouraging, um, engaging with uh, teams that have very creative ideas. On the data set side, on the application side, on the science side as well. Uh, as I said, many things to be invented. It's hard today to be a scientist in the field because you do need to have compute. Uh, it's easy to have good ideas, and these are ideas that we'd like to promote. Yeah, I would like to know uh, how difficult is it to do like domain adaptation with Mistral? Um, uh, if I want like to teach it, like to be very good on a specific uh, language uh, of like some professionals or what? So language is something that you probably don't want to domain adapt too much. So if you have a pre-trained model which is speaking only English, uh, it's a bit hard to make it speak another language later on. So you really want to start with multilingual languages, uh, multilingual models. Uh, that's one thing, you, it's pretty hard to domain adapt. Uh, it's similar with code, like taking a language model that is bad at code, Mistral 7B is good at code, it's pretty hard to make it good at code. So you don't want to domain adapt too much, that's the purpose of pre-training. Uh, when we pre-train a model, we try to cover as much domain as possible. Uh, now, it's, um, once you have this coverage, you can actually allow any kind of modification to the model with just a few examples and it's going to work well. So really the magic of generative AI is to have a pre-training that covers most of the space and then you only need a few examples to, to show the model the task to resolve. So that's, the, that's how we solve domain adaptation. There's no domain to adapt because every domain is covered. <coughs> Hello. Um, so you mentioned uh, running on, on device, uh, the model, uh, so iPhone, MacBook, um, but what are the main uh, challenges in, in the long term to get like regular people to, to run uh, your model uh, on device? I think it's happening. It's a uh, hard thing to do is that um, ideally when you deploy on devices, you probably want to be slightly smaller than 7B. Um, Something that hasn't been increasing very fast, as you've noticed, is the memory capacity of smartphones. Uh, as it turns out, the memory capacity of smartphones is bounded by the battery capacity of smartphones. And this, w this is one of the things that follows a very slow Moore law. So, uh, so that's, the, that's the reason why you still have 8 gigabyte uh, smartphones. And if you have a 7B model and you deploy it on 8 gigabyte uh, memory, well, you don't have a lot of memory left. So that's, the, that's I think, a standing issue, which means that uh, models should probably be slightly smaller. Uh, and um, But there's still a lot of leeway to make them smaller. So there's some, I expect that uh, improvement will be more made on the software side than on the hardware side. Uh, but we can also expect some interesting things on dynamic memory, uh, so memory that don't take too much battery, but is only used, uh, well, that only wakes up when used. So really, I think uh, that edge device, LLM on edge devices, is going to be a very interesting thing. Uh, the good aspect of it is that, first of all, it doesn't bear uh, a large uh, cloud cost, so that's good. And it's private by design, because 
sometimes if you want to have if you have to have like private conversation with a chatbot or anything that is related to your private life, then maybe you don't want it to, to land on the cloud. So uh, there's a lot of opportunities in that field indeed. Uh, hello, uh, Theo Ding, uh, data scientist for Total Energies. Uh, I had a question about the sliding window uh, of context. Uh, you said you had like 4K uh, length of tokens. Does it mean that in theory, if you have enough time to process everything, you can have an unlimited amount of tokens that you can process? So you don't really have unlimited because you're, it's like CNN. So um, you, have, um, like you have a local window, and since everything is connected, and if you look at basically the support of your gradient, uh, you have uh, the, the size is, I think, 132K. Um, and that's because you multiply the, the size of the, of the sliding window with the depth. Uh, so in theory, you have a very large um, uh, sliding window attention. You still need to do a little fine tuning uh, to make it happen. It doesn't happen naturally. You need to have uh, like very long document to teach the model to do the propagation that is enabled by its architecture. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk and thank you very much for uh, your contribution to the uh, community. I have a question about uh, uh, the community, do you uh, plan to publish uh, research papers about like uh, improvement on neural network architectures? So we have released a research paper on, that, on, on the architecture side. Uh, this is not the focus of the company. Uh, we're, um, we're really about uh, shipping things at work. Uh, we all, all come from the academic space. So we do know how, how long it takes to write papers, how long it takes to review them. Uh, we will be uh, publishing. Uh, we will be sparsely publishing. Okay. We have, I think, time for one, two. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Archer, for your speech. You mentioned the KV catch as one of the bottlenecks in uh, model training and performances. What do you think are the next challenges for performances and training? Thank you. Well, you do. There's many things to be invented. The thing is that uh, one issue with uh, transformers is that they spend the same amount of compute on small, on small, on uh, easy task and hard task, and this is an unsolved problem. You probably want to spend more time on, on prediction tasks that should involve more reasoning. Uh, this is not something that anybody has solved. Uh, that's probably one of the key to moving on to the next generations. Um, being able to also locate good data is, uh, is a very important thing. Uh, being able to leverage better the hardware we have is also quite important. Uh, in that setting companies like us uh, are very interested in working with hardware providers and uh, yeah many uh, reasoning adaptive compute better hardware utilization better data that's the that's probably the, the ingredients of the next generation yeah. uh, i have a question about the size of the parameters uh, in both ways so uh, from your perspective how small do you think you could get and have the same performance of 7B? So how small could you imagine a, a model could get? And the other side, what would be, on the other side, what would be the size uh, that big that would create something very different with your technology? It's hard to say, uh, I can't give you a number. Uh, you can get smaller than 7B, uh, you can make models very, very large, but that's going to cost you a lot, a lot, a lot of money. So uh, the larger your, the, the amount of money you need to spend on, on a model of a certain size is basically quadratic in its size. So if you move beyond the 100, uh, you start to be in the range of 50 million. If you move beyond that, you start to be in very large range. And the thing is that you're hitting diminishing returns, so maybe you don't want to spend that money. So that's the, um, uh, generally speaking, I don't expect to see much larger models than 100 billion parameters. We'll see how that goes, but uh, there's definitely some uh, limit. Uh, you want the model to be as small as possible and as capable as possible uh, because you want it to be cheap to serve and cheap to train. Uh, so I expect that uh, reasonably we won't see models that will be more than one trillion, one trillion uh, parameter. Good. Thank you.
Thank you, Arthur. Uh, next, at 5.25, we will have Jeff Wittig of Ampere, uh, Chief Product Officer of Ampere, to join us uh, to talk about AI power efficiency.
Welcome back. Joining us now to talk about uh, AI's power efficiency revolution is Jeff Wittig of Ampere. Give him a hand. All right, thanks everybody. So let me first introduce uh, Ampere a little bit. So I'm Jeff Wittick. I'm the Chief Product Officer at, at Ampere. Uh, Ampere, we are a, a roughly six-year-old company, uh, and we are a modern semiconductor company that's building something that's very unique. We're building uh, what we call the first cloud-native processors, and the goal is to build processors that can deliver a sustainable cloud. And I'll talk today about how that applies then to sustainable AI as well. Because the time is now to change the trajectory of computing. For the last decade or more, we've been using a set of legacy technologies that were really developed for a different use case, a different era. An era where applications were large and monolithic, where software was not distributed uh, across many, many nodes, uh, a world that was dominated by uh, enterprise applications. Clearly, the world has changed. We're in an era of massive cloud adoption and obviously uh, massive adoption of AI as well. If you look, though, at the impact that this growth in computing has had on the, the world, on the environment, it's massive. Today, the data center industry consumes about 3% of the world's power. It emits about 3% of the world's greenhouse gases as well. And that's a lot. That's actually more than um, industries like aviation that we typically think of um, as, as being uh, you know, fairly dirty. Uh, so we do have a responsibility to ensure that we continue to reduce the share of power the data centers consume. And the only way to do that is by fundamentally changing the trajectory of the compute itself. And not only is the environmental impact incredibly large, but it's also just become really difficult to deploy more and more compute, more and more data centers around the world. Now, some of this is because of those environmental challenges. Uh, there's no more power available today. The amount of power we have uh, globally is uh, still roughly the same as it was a decade or two ago, and that poses big constraints. It's not easy to go and build a new data center uh, to procure more power for that data center. In fact, we shouldn't be. We should be living within the footprint. Power costs have also gone up tremendously uh, over the last couple of years. So there's a large operational expense associated with, uh, with power in the data center. And so that's what we set out to do at Ampere. Uh, we built processors that were designed for cloud environments. That's why we call them uh, cloud-native processors. They run cloud-native applications of all types incredibly well, applications like web servers, databases, caching layers, video encoding, but also AI inferencing. AI inferencing has been uh, one of the very important workloads that we've focused on for the last couple of years. With our processors, we're able to deliver amazing levels of performance, really, really high scalability. Our processors today uh, range from 32 to 192 cores, so a lot of cores to pack into those racks, and they're incredibly efficient. So before I talk a little bit more about how our processors and how some different approaches to inferencing could help us on the sustainability front, let's also just talk about what are we talking about when we refer to inferencing versus training. Now, I'm sure most people in the, in the room uh, are, are very familiar with this. You know, training is the act of actually building the model. You train the model, validate it, and then now it's time to deploy. And when you deploy, you're, you're inferencing. Uh, and training and inferencing tasks are really different. Uh, Training typically is one, one very, very large task uh, that maybe runs for several months when you look at some of the new multi-hundred billion or even trillion parameter models. Uh, so it's one big task, and your priorities might be different when it comes to training versus inferencing. With training, the goal might be to just reduce the time to train. If, if it, that costs more money, that takes more power, that might be an acceptable trade-off because time to train is incredibly important. But now when it's time to run inferencing, now you have a different challenge. Now you have a scale challenge. Now you're taking that model that took a long time to train, and now you're running it maybe millions of times a second. And you're probably looking to run it globally. So you need to be able to place that model in various types of compute all around the world in different types of environments. So you have a very different challenge when it comes to inferencing. And so inferencing must be power efficient. It must be cost effective as well. And when you look at the amount of compute required 
for training versus inferencing. Again, training is one big task, so we tend to think of it as all the computes in training. And it's, there is a large amount of concentrated computing happening within training. Inferencing is a lot of smaller compute, but the volume is massive. You know, various estimates of how large the inference market is versus the training market range from uh, here, it's about 6x, so 85% of the uh, compute that deployed for AI uh, is expected to be inference versus training. Other estimates are as much as 10x the amount of compute required for inferencing. But again, a different type of computing task. So there are different trade-offs that you can make. And so one of the trade-offs that we talk a lot to customers about is you know, right-sizing the compute. You know, you look at something like AI training, and, and maybe there the right solution is some really, really large GPUs uh, that have a lot of memory bandwidth, a lot of parallel compute capabilities. Uh, they consume a lot of power, um, but they achieve your training task uh, in a much lower amount of time. But then as you look at the range of different applications, as you start to get into retraining, as you get into inferencing for large language models, and then inferencing for uh, smaller models, computer vision, uh, recommender models, a different type of compute is often possible to use. You know, at the, at the range of kind of uh, smaller models, computer vision, a, a CPU-only uh, server is probably the right choice. And that actually extends pretty far out. You know, we've, we've seen really amazing results even up into the 7 to 10 billion parameter models running inferencing on CPUs. And the beauty of using a CPU uh, for inferencing is that they're more efficient, uh, they consume a lot less power, they're more flexible. You can run any workload on a CPU. So when you're done running inferencing, uh, you can also run a web server, run a database. And they're incredibly scalable. You can place these CPUs anywhere around the world. You can place them out at edge locations uh, where you want low latency inferencing to run for, say, safety uh, sensitive applications. So right sizing your compute is important. You may want really, really big compute for training. When you get into the inferencing space, pick the right amount of compute for the actual model size uh, and for the outcome that you're expecting. And that will help you to reduce your cost and also reduce the overall global footprint from your compute. You know, just a simple example here uh, as to why we need to explore other approaches and why Scaleway has made other uh, options available to customers than just GPU-based servers. You look at a single DGX system uh, with eight H100s in it. That can consume about 10.2 kilowatts, just that one server. And if you built a big cluster of those, let's say you had 11,800 DGX systems, you know, that would actually consume 1% of all the renewable power in France, that one cluster of DGX servers. So, so clearly, we're not going to be able to build uh, a ton of these large clusters. We need to use them where they are best suited, and we need to use other more efficient solutions where we're able to. You know, and there's other trends underway, too, from an AI perspective when it comes to economizing and optimizing. You know, today, we're really in kind of the end of the research phase. We're in the you know, peak of the hype cycle, and we're now getting into the adoption phase. So whereas previously, R&D was the priority, uh, peak performance was all that you cared about, you know, throw all compute available at the problem because you just needed to prove out that these large language models were capable of being generated, building huge general models that have uh, really broad knowledge bases. You know, we're starting to transition from that to now focusing on how we scale these in an economical way. You know, how you right size it, and even the models themselves are starting to change. You know, we'll still have really, really large, you know, multi trillion parameter models, but we're also starting to see the emergence of a lot of more specialized models for various reasons. That could be because of the economics uh, of running a smaller model, it could be because um, you want to use maybe a proprietary set of data to train that model, and so it's not appropriate to. Uh, use that proprietary data as part of um, you know, some sort of large uh, general AI foundational model. And so there's a lot of places here where uh, model sizes are starting to become optimized, uh, and that opens up a really wide range of possibilities uh, in terms of the compute solutions that you can use to run that inferencing. And so at Ampere, like I said, we focused on uh, AI from the start. Um, our CPUs are incredibly well suited for inferencing, and it's easy for people to use. Uh, great out-of-the-box performance. We have a set of libraries 
uh, that we call AIO that are publicly available. They're easy to deploy. Under the hood, they do a lot of optimizations around the data itself and also around there's a microkernel that uh, helps to improve the performance of the processing itself. But all of that is invisible to the, to the end user. The end user is able to use this, uh, these software libraries, run any framework that uh, they commonly might be using, PyTorch, TensorFlow, Onyx, run on our CPUs and get amazing performance. Um, also, one of the things that people are doing to also economize their models is using lower precision, uh, using FP16 instead of FP32, even using int8 or int16. Uh, that's a great way to, uh, to also economize those models. Um, you're essentially able to uh, reduce the compute overhead by 2 to 4x, and oftentimes there's no real loss in accuracy. And our processors were built to support uh, many, many numerical formats and uh, support those out of the box without uh, any additional work needed on the part of the customer besides quantizing the, the model itself. And so that's why it's really exciting that uh, today Scaleway announced the, uh, the new instances available uh, at Scaleway based on the, the Ampere Ultra family of processors. Uh, and these are not only great for general purpose workloads, but really, really good for AI inferencing. Uh, they're going to give you the best price performance for most AI models, just to give you a sense of what that might look like. Um, if you hear a bunch of different, uh, different types of models uh, running on our CPUs versus any of the other CPUs that are out there, the Intel, the, the AMD uh, CPUs, uh, the Ampere performance in terms of inferences per second is in red there. Uh, but across whether it's recommender models, computer vision, uh, natural language processing, translation, um, you know, other transformers, you're going to get the best uh, performance out of an Ampere CPU. And then when you look at it in the cloud, so this is comparing what Ampere looks like in the cloud, say a scaleway type instance versus all the different options that say AWS might have, uh, which are a lot of Intel instances, Graviton, some GPU attached instances there. Uh, you know, as an end user, you're going to get the best performance per euro here. So the most inferences per second uh, per cost per hour. So really, really great economical solution. And you can also feel good about the fact that behind the scenes, it's consuming a lot less power than any of these other solutions. Uh, the other thing, too, is just to kind of put it into context, um, you know, if you look at what a deployment of, say, inferencing on Ampere CPUs looks like versus, say, a bunch of DGX boxes, you know, let's say you had a typical, let's say a one megawatt data center. So uh, a little bit on the smaller side. Uh, let's say it has a PUE of about 1.1. You've got 15 kilowatt racks in there. Uh, what would the difference be between building it out with Ampere CPUs and with uh, NVIDIA GPUs? Well, with Ampere CPUs, uh, you could deploy about 2,400 servers uh, in that data center. Uh, with the NVIDIA DGX boxes, you'd run out of power after you deployed 60 servers. So each rack has a single server in it, so a lot of wasted space. Um, and the cost is a lot less. It costs about $19 million to build out that cluster with Ampere. It costs about $27 million to build it out with, uh, with those NVIDIA boxes. And the overall inferencing performance is a lot higher with that big scale-out solution uh, with all those servers. You're actually getting here uh, over four times more inferencing performance on the Ampere cluster versus the NVIDIA one. The other great thing is that when you're not running inferencing, uh, you can run a lot of other workloads on the 2400 servers. So you could run over 20 times more, say, web server requests uh, on that Ampere instance uh, cluster than you could with those DGX boxes. So those DGX boxes, you know, when they're not being used, they're just pretty expensive space heaters. When you're not, using, when you're not running inferencing on those uh, Ampere servers, you can do useful work across the rest of your cloud. And I just wanted to wrap with uh, a couple of examples of what's happening out in the industry and what Ampere is doing. Uh, Lampy is a great example. This is a customer that's actually running on Scaleway now on the Ampere instances. So they're using the Ampere instances for AI inferencing, uh, and they were able to achieve 10 times uh, better speed in terms of performance, and they were able to reduce their costs uh, to only one-tenth of what they were before when they were using x86 processors. So uh, real results. Uh, being achieved today. And the last thing I'll wrap with is, it's not just about Ampere, uh, it's actually all about innovation across the entire industry. A couple of weeks ago, we kicked off a, a new industry group called the AI Platform Alliance. Uh, we have 10 members right now, people like Cerebrus, Furiosa, Graphcore, uh, 
Canara, you can see the names right there. But these are all uh, companies that are building super innovative inference solutions uh, and other AI solutions as well that will be part of an overall solution set that provides you the ability to even more granularly right size your compute and to deliver amazing efficiency in a bunch of different environments, whether in big data centers or out at the edge. So uh, we strongly believe in uh, fostering this innovation within the industry and that industry uh, innovation be open, it be efficient, it be sustainable. Uh, and so we're going to keep uh, driving the industry in this direction, uh, creating amazing solutions, uh, not just with our Ampere products, but also with all of our partners uh, across the entire market. So with that, thank you. I uh, appreciate the time here. And uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Jeff. That was incredibly compelling. We will be talking a little bit more uh, energy efficiency and sustainability. Jeff will join us again for a panel discussion with three other speakers. That's starting at 5.45. Join us then.
Okay, thanks for joining us. Uh, we have Jeff Wittek, CPO of Ampere, uh, joining us again, as well as Jean-Louis from uh, Gladia, founder of Gladia, as a matter of fact, uh, Marian, CTO of Powder, and moderating this panel, we have Geoffrey, uh, who is the CPO of Hire My AI. Thank you. Hello everyone. So we will uh, we will start uh, the last but not the least uh, session panel of the day. I am uh, Geoffrey Cambefort, the co-founder and CPO of Hire My AI, a platform to uh, hire and trade your AI agents. We are using the infrastructure of uh, Scaleway. Training models involve compromises, while inference um, represents a million of diverse tasks. A report by Bloomberg estimates that the inference market should grow over $80 billion in five years. This session will focus on the technical challenges and practical use cases of inference. Optimization will be the main keyword, sustainability, cost efficiency, and of course we want performant inferences. Dear speakers, starting with you, Jeff, please introduce yourself and explain us how your company relates to inference. Okay, perfect. So Jeff Wittick, uh, Chief Product Officer at, uh, at Ampere. Um, if you heard my talk a few minutes ago, um, I'll, uh, I'll go a little bit deeper. Uh, so Ampere, we're about a six-year-old company. Uh, we're building CPUs that are uh, incredibly high performance, uh, but are also incredibly power efficient. Uh, we have a couple of products in the market today. We have our Ampere Ultra processors. We have our Ampere One processors. Uh, so you can span anywhere from 32 cores to 192 cores. And that means you can deploy these uh, really anywhere. You can deploy them out at the edge. You can deploy them in big uh, hyperscale data centers. Uh, and they're meant to be deployed for data center tasks of all types uh, in cloud environments. And as it relates back to this, inferencing is one of the major tasks that we built the processors for, uh, that we optimize them around, and it's one of the major tasks that people are running on our processors today. So our goal is to provide a more efficient uh, inferencing solution that's also more flexible, and, and that ends up resulting in power savings and cost savings for customers. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for attending this conference. So my name is Jean-Louis Guéguiner. Um, French, as you hear from my beautiful French accent. Uh, founder of Gladia, we are a company focusing on uh, speech-to-text uh, and focusing on very high quality uh, speech-to-text uh, dedicated to multiple verticals. Uh, we started the company a year and a half ago um, and we have a lot of customers that are very satisfied from uh, the media industry to the uh, call center industry, um, meeting recordings as well as uh, medical. Um, it seems that our model is also extremely good at medical. We didn't expect that. Um, and that's pretty much it, yeah. Thank you. Hey, so I'm Marian. I'm CTO at Powder. Uh, so basically what we do is that uh, we search clips uh, in how long videos. Um, so to do that, um, we use a lot of different AI models and we have uh, pretty specific uh, challenges regarding uh, inference as uh, videos are pretty big. So maybe that's it. Me. Thank you, thank you, Marianne. Uh, so Jean-Louis, uh, I think you have a big exclusive announcement for us. We have a big announcement, yes. We um, are releasing our new model starting on, uh, on Monday. Uh, it's a module that is uh, based on the Whisper architecture um, and is called the Whisper Zero because it doesn't have any hallucinations. So we're going to talk about inference and hallucinations, which is one of the big problems that you have with LLMs and architectures such as uh, Whisper, which is the same as the LLM architectures uh, when you're performing in France. So we release this new model. It's uh, 60 times better, 60% time, 60% uh, better than the previous model, um, and we use 1.5 million hours of audio in uh, multiple environments, meaning like uh, clean uh, environments, not only clinical environments, but like environments that are complex, also phonetic, uh, uh, sorry, phone calls, um, as well as very noisy environment uh, on the street, for instance. Um, 
And so this model is performing like extremely well with an extremely uh, high accuracy that has not been seen in the, in the market so far. So we're very excited about that. Wow, thank you for this announcement. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Now, uh, Marianne, you, uh, you are a new CTO. Yeah. So d can you share with us uh, what are your uh, challenges about AI today? So, so yeah, indeed, I was a uh, lead AI two weeks ago, <laughs> and now I'm uh, the CTO. Um, so at Powder, we have many technical challenges. Um, so mainly, as we process videos, um, we have challenges not only um, regarding the runtime of AI, but uh, also with the pre-processing, because like a 4K video uh, can reach like uh, 160 gigabytes of, uh, of data, and uh, you need to process this in a few minutes. Um, and so you have uh, to optimize your model a lot. You have uh, to optimize the pre-processing a lot uh, because uh, you need to decode the video. You need to, uh, to be super efficient with your formats and to uh, handle GPUs properly. And we do all this uh, at the edge uh, because we don't want to have uh, an IO bottleneck uh, with the network. Uh, so that adds another layer of uh, complexity. Thank you, Marianne. And now, uh, Jeff, uh, how are you uh, helping tech teams to build uh, cost-efficient inferences, please. Yeah, that's a, that's a big part of what we've really been doing. It, it comes in a couple different layer, layers. Um, obviously, we're working with people like Scaleway to provide infrastructure um, that end customers can take advantage of, but it goes beyond just, just that. Um, it's also us partnering directly with uh, companies that are building or running uh, AI models. Uh, we have our uh, software libraries called AIO uh, that makes it very easy for them to get up and running. So if they're using PyTorch today, they don't need to change anything. They can go and run on our processors right away uh, and get extremely optimized performance. Uh, but it also, we end up working uh, fairly closely with, uh, with some of these companies um, at an even deeper level to help them actually optimize their, their models and help economize things. Um, one of the things that often happens is that uh, companies train their models on big GPU clusters. And then their first instinct is, when it comes time for inferencing to run those models, just deploy them on the same machines. Uh, the problem is that it gets really expensive really fast. And so uh, companies often come to us asking whether there's a more efficient solution uh, that'll help them to be able to run their models more broadly, not run out of money, um, and, and also deploy them in more places. So uh, we often work with them to help to um, not only get them up and running on our hardware, um, but off oftentimes it also involves um, working with them on um, their models themselves uh, to see if there's actually ways to um, you know, optimize the model size in order to um, you know, be able to run on more efficient solutions. So kind of it, it runs, runs the gamut uh, from the hardware side to the actual kind of full uh, software and, and use case. Super, thank you. Uh, just a question for the room, please, to know a, a little bit uh, our audience. Please raise your hand if uh, you already uh, uh, deploy an inference, uh, LLM inference, please. Okay, and keep your hand if you uh, keep your hand up, please. If you have uh, a LLM inference in production, please. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> so um, now we will uh, spend more time in a debate, <laughs> debate style. Don't hesitate to react uh, each other, and I will uh, stay silent. I promise. So the first uh, th theme will be uh, about uh, machine learning uh, operations, MLOps, and uh, automation as part of your workflows. So, how do you keep, how, how do you maintain a great quality of inference uh, with automations? As you said, uh, with the zero uh, hallucination, how do, you do, how do you do that in your companies? Do you want to start? Do you want to start? Well, I think maybe, yeah, I think you, you could probably talk more to what you specifically do. Uh, you know, since we're building solutions um, you know, for people that are actually building models, um, kind of what our big part in it is, is really making it as easy as possible um, in order to uh, provide the most computing power so that, you know, whether it's improving uh, training accuracy, whether it's helping to quantize things with greater levels of accuracy, you know, I think we're, we're kind of in the, in the game of making it easy for you to be able to do more and for it to be very, very simple to deploy. But I'd love to hear more about what, what you're doing specifically with your model itself uh, in this area. So for, for the model itself, there are <clears throat> multiple ways to see it. You talk about automations. Automations can be hardware 
or even, um, let's say, software automation, and then you have process automation, which are extremely important too. We deal with audio, but you can see, you talk about machine learning. Machine learning is like widely spread in the organizations. And some of the use cases are, for instance, fraud, anti-fraud systems. So it's not only about how you deploy inference, right, on CPU, GPUs. It also goes into how do you automate your workflows within the company? How do you collect the data from the customers? How do you reinforce your system to make sure that the model gets better over time? And how do you handle what is called the drift of the data? How do you make sure that your model doesn't overfit the reality? And to avoid having the processes that are coded but are not fitting the reality anymore. So that's the one thing on the process side. And then you have the question of the hardware and the software. And that's extremely complex. You have zero downtime. That's what people are asking. If you're training something, training is easy. Training, you can break the machine. You can relaunch. Nobody cares. You're going to be late for one week. If you break the machine, for instance, in our sector for transcription, you don't have any medical transcription anymore. You're breaking a medical service. If you're breaking your sales process with your customers, you're losing all the transcriptions. The CRM won't be up to date. You're breaking the, the productivity of your, of your teams. Okay? And maybe they were not taking notes during the meetings. They were focusing on the customers, looking at them in the eyes to make sure you have a good engagement. You're losing all the informations. That's bad. And I can go on and on and on. So you have two things to consider. The reliability of the infrastructure and the reliability of your processes and the reliability of the software chain and the data chain all over. So it's not only about IT, it's not only about infrastructure, it's also about the data that flows in and out of your systems. Thank you. So on our side, we, we also have um, topics tied to infrastructure and a lot of CI to, to manage uh, the models. We have around 50, um, yeah, 50 models um, running in, uh, in our app. So we, we need to maintain all of them. Um, we need to be able to be sure that every time we release, uh, we are sure that the model uh, don't regress. Um, but we also have to attach a lot of metadata, uh, both to the models and to uh, the output we are producing, because have, as our models are running on uh, the device of our users, um, if there is a crash, we need to have a way to get back logs to understand what happened. Um, and so we need to know uh, which model was the one uh, which crashed, um, why, uh, for example, on which data was this model was trained, so to, um, to be able to grasp uh, really quickly what was the issue and to solve it uh, as quick as possible. Okay, thank you. <coughs> you do you want to uh, respond? Well, I, I, I like what you, you brought up about the differences between inferencing and training in terms of how reliability matters, because you're right, in, in training, reliability matters, but in a different way, it's recoverable. Um, and you're right that on the inferencing piece, having incredibly reliable, uh, systems with high uptime is is incredibly important. And kind of a related piece to it is is also um, having predictability and consistency in the results for inferencing matters a lot more as well. In training, um, having variability in, in in the training runs isn't really that big of a deal. Um, it doesn't matter um, if it changes from hour to hour how much throughput you have, for instance. But in inferencing, it really matters if the latency changes dramatically from minute to minute. Um, you need to have consistent latency. Uh, those latency tails kill you because the time that the inferencing result took, you know, a second instead of 100 milliseconds, that might be a completely lost result for somebody. Um, they've moved on. They've missed. You've missed the critical time frame, uh, and that is one of the areas that we really focus on from a hardware perspective: is ensuring that we're delivering hardware. When we say scalability, we don't just mean lots and lots of compute. We also mean that you can scale. Um, to many, many users and many, many workloads without losing that consistency in latency. Because once you lose that consistency in latency, it's useless. Okay. And now um, developers um, they in, the, in the room and online watching us, uh, they want to have practical advices about how to cut uh, their spendings uh, from test to production. It's, it's obvious. So what are you doing in your companies, please, um, to control your inference costs and um, to reduce your impact on the environment? It's also something where sustainability is very uh, big quite, quite now. So for, right. for us, the approach is quite radical. Uh, we don't use the cloud for inference. <laughs> like Great. We, use, um, we, we are a specific um, case because 
our customers. Uh, most of them are either streamers or video editors, so like, they have really good hardware, they have a workstation with good GPUs and a uh, large amount of memories. Um, so it's easy for us to, to run models on the hardware. Um, and so we, we exploit this uh, computational power um, and deploying um, our models that as an API don't have like, um, a really huge additional value for these customers. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to go, Jeff, you already gave a big part of the answer. Um, there are many techniques to optimize your model. Uh, not only optimizing um, in a sense that the, the quality but goes also to the size of the model. Mm -hmm. um, and what's funny is in, in the latest development of, of AI, it seems that the two of them are correlated. So if you distill a model, for instance, there are ways that you can get rid of many parameters in your models and you have like, we had Mistral just before, we had like many companies talking about LLMs, these big models, lot of parameters. Some of them are useless, even worse than that. <laughs> Some of them are penalizing you. And so getting rid of those is helping you to have a better memory impact, reducing the size of the hardware, reducing the time to get your model up to speed into the memory, reducing the speed of, uh, improving the speed of inference, reducing the latency. And so with that, you are able either to fit more models within the same uh, systems, or you are able to have smaller GPU card, for instance, and a big card, like we said, V100 is 250 watts. What is 250 watts? It's two MacBooks like old MacBooks, Intel MacBooks. I'm not talking about the ARM MacBooks because they are way more efficient. So it's like two big computers. That's one card. If you go on the T4 or L4 that was announced, 60 watt. So it only, not only matters on the quality that I said, it matters on how many models you are able to run on the same infrastructure and it matters on what is the impact in the power consumptions. And lastly, because you have a smaller model or you're reducing, for instance, the representation of the numbers within the card. Maybe you don't need 32 bytes, maybe you need 16 or eight, and you get rid of the things that don't matter. What's gonna happen? You need a bit less transistors. And so if you look at the end cost for the environment of those cards and those, those elements that we are building, 80%, around 80% to 90% of the CO2 that is being emitted is not at the consumption level. It's when you use trucks to excavate all the, 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 all the earth and do a lot of treatment to actually get the materials to build the cards. So 80 to 90% of the impact is not when you're running and savings, I don't know, 200 watts. It's when you're building. And so the less transistor you're gonna have, the better impact you're gonna have in the environment. So you have many levels to optimize, but we need to think hand to hand when you're building a cloud or an infrastructure. So it goes back to the cloud and inference. Inference is really good. It goes back to the cloud. Should you buy yourself GPUs or not? We are going into the cloud for impacts that are good impact in, in CO2 because if we don't use infrastructure during the night, because everyone is sleeping in Europe, someone else is able to use it. So we don't have to buy to, to build two cards. We are building twice less cards, better impact on, uh, impact on the environment. So we need to think hand to hand when doing AI and we have a responsibility toward that. Okay, thanks. Jeff, you want to add something? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the, the elements of power efficiency are really, and sustainability are really important. Because, yeah, we, a lot of times we think just of the, uh, the power that's being consumed when you're actually running the CPU or the GPU. And, and those numbers are, you know, can sometimes be kind of staggering. I mean, you look at something like an H100 card, that, that can be 700 watts. Um, so you've got the power that's being consumed there. The hidden cost of power is the cost to cool um, that hardware. Um, you don't directly see that, but behind the scenes, a lot of power is being used to actually draw all the heat um, away from, from that CPU or GPU. So you know, being able to, to run at lower powers has a dual benefit there. And you're right, um, there is all of the other um, impact from the actual manufacturing of the CPU or the GPU. So I think that's where if you can improve utilization, um, use every single cycle on that CPU or that piece of hardware, you know, that means less of them need to get, uh, need to get built. Uh, that means a smaller environmental impact. And, and I think that's where, I think from our perspective, you know, being able to run with CPUs means they're, they're utilized all the time because when you're not running inferencing, someone else might be running a web server on that same piece of, of hardware. And, and, and just to give you a, a tiny number, you should look at something that is called PUE, 
power usage efficiency, which is the ratio of the number of watts that you're using to run the system and the number of watts that you're able to get from the calculation. Mm -hmm. And if you look with all the systems, it's extremely interesting to look at different cloud providers. And if within the same cloud provider, depending on where you are in the globe, it won't be the same. So if you're running a GPU in Canada during the winter, it's going to be very good. If you're running in Canada during the summer, it's going to be very bad. If you're running the same card in the same conditions, but in a state where you're using cold to run the uh, power, the, I would say the, uh, the electricity is going to be bad. We are lucky we are in France, we have nuclear energy, so you have a good PUI. We have a, a good weather, PUI is really good, and the CO2 impact is really good. And all those things should help you to make better decisions um, towards the optimizations of your inference. Um, regarding what you said, um, with uh, using more chips and uh, like reducing earth extraction um, by using a uh, cloud, um, I'm not sure I fully agree with that because um, today, um, if you look at, let's say, any iPhone, uh, you have pretty powerful chips in it. Uh, I don't know if you run tests with the last uh, um, Apple Silicon chips, uh, but you can get pretty decent results uh, when running models on them. Um, so I wouldn't be so partial, let's say, towards the cloud. Um, for me, it's, there is value in uh, using chips that are already there uh, because uh, everybody has a phone and a laptop. Agreed and don't agree. I think it's the point <laughs> there. Uh, Humper is doing an amazing job as pushing the same type of architecture. You talk about Apple chips. This is, this is the architecture that you have, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in the morning, we have announcements for M2 chips in the cloud. So still, you can get very good uh, consumptions and price for the type of flops that you can have. Um, and, and finally, you have a question that is really interesting because we don't have the same type of personas and we don't have the same type of customers. Your customers don't really care about privacy. They're running their own stuff for themselves. Um, when you're running an hospital, I don't know if you went into an hospital, I will let you check the type of computer they have <laughs> and the OS they're running, probably Windows NT, 20 years old. <laughs> you can't run a good speech recognition. And I challenge you to run those models with good um, transcriptions of the, of the drugs that the, 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 the physician is spending, I'm sure 100% you won't be able to have any words coming out of it. So it depends on your customer, it depends on the privacy, it depends on many factors. If you're looking in the enterprise grade, I think you have not really big choices except going into the cloud, because there is another factor that you need to take into consideration, is what is called the capex, the capital expense you're gonna have at, at first for your project how much money you're gonna put up front and the cost for money, let's be honest, right now, is pretty expensive. Two years ago it was pretty 0% interest or very close. Now it's very expensive. Should you put your money there, money there or should you go into the cloud? Cloud is a bank. Cloud is a bank. They are taking money, buying, also I would say, uh, like big spaces, building data centers, managing the cooling, making payment up front to buy a server and you're only paying the rent on a day. So there are all these questions about privacy, et cetera, security, resilience, okay? Those things are super important. Like if your customer is losing, or your, your user is losing like poor in his apartment, should you stop the transcription of the physicians that are, that are there? No, you still should have still the, the, the process running. So all these things are extremely important. Depends on the use case, on the personnel. So again, for inference, you should define what is the appropriate uh, use case and, and the tools you're going to use. Do you want to rebound again? Oh, just maybe a, a bad joke. Uh, the data center can take uh, fire. Also. Yeah. <laughs> we remember. <laughs> I won't say anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's enough remember. That's so <laughs> so uh, let's talk about, uh, about the edge approach. Um, I think at Ampere you have um, a lot of uh, companies asking you how to build uh, quality with edge devices uh, use cases. Can you explain more about this? 
Yeah, that um, that's, is a big part of our, our strategy. We talk a lot about cloud. But when we talk about cloud, we're really talking like very, very broadly. Uh, we're talking about cloud infrastructures or a cloud architecture. So that could be a big public cloud. That could be an enterprise running their own cloud. But increasingly, it's, it's a lot of edge uh, deployments that really look like the, the cloud. Because what's happened at the edge is that you used to have a lot of dumb devices that were just uh, ingesting data, they were sending that data back somewhere else, it was being processed, and then it was being sent back again. And that doesn't, doesn't really work now because you're trying to do uh, more analytics, you're trying to apply a lot of AI to the data that's coming in, and a lot of times the reason why you're collecting that data at the edge is because you actually want to use that data at the edge to do something else. Think uh, you know, traffic monitoring in a city or some sort of autonomous uh, driving solution. So you need a lot of compute sitting out there really close to where the data is, is being collected. And, um, the challenge is that many of the devices that were sitting out there traditionally just don't have that type of compute. There were low power devices, but they didn't have a lot of compute because they didn't have to. Um, so what we've spent a lot of time uh, on, and, and we have a number of, of customers uh, deploying our solutions into, is these high performance edge environments where maybe you don't even have the ability to cool. Um, there's no fan. Uh, maybe it's a really dirty environment. Maybe you just can't afford the power of a fan. So being able to run, say, a 40 watt CPU that has 32 cores, um, out in these extreme locations is, is incredibly uh, important. And it kind of fills that spectrum in of uh, different ways that you might be running AI inferencing. So quickly on that, you talk about cooling. That's never, you need to handle the, the conditions. I'm going to give you just numbers. Um, we run many benchmarks, but if you take a GPU and you go over for, from 40 degrees, which is the maximum operating temperature you should have, and you go to 50 degrees, so only 10 degrees, 10 degrees, the power of execution degrade by 20%. Just to give you how difficult it is to operate those systems. So again, we talk about cloud providers environments. So maybe you can run on edge, but you don't handle exactly the condition with running. So 20% mean like it's running down by 20%. The numbers, if you go like above 50%, 50 it's like 50% above, sorry, 50 degrees, it's like 50% degradation in speed. So it's really important to have good conditions as you, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And uh, Marianne, uh, at uh, Polio GG, you have uh, a lot of uh, devices you are deploying on, on the devices of your customers, your users. Uh, do you have other edges approach, uh, edge approaches? Well, um, for us, the main challenge uh, when running uh, OAI on edge um, is handling the difference you can have in hardware. Um, so it can be having different uh, instruction sets uh, in CPUs, for example. Uh, you, you get different performance when you have uh, AVX2 or AVX512 uh, uh, available on your CPU. Um, and then regarding the GPU, uh, I would say there the software is uh, as, if not more important than the hardware, um, because uh, I don't know if, if anyone in the room um, has tried to uh, to deploy a model on an AMD GPU, uh, but it's really not fun at all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, you too. You already deployed on this hardware. Uh, AMD. Yeah. Or uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so it's a good transition for the next question uh, about the hardware. So, um, um, when you need to choose uh, the right hardware, uh, uh, what is your advice? Because we have CPU, GPUs, clusters. We love uh, all these words, but uh, maybe you can go deeper in the tech uh, how to choose widely the good hardware. I think from my perspective, you know, it, it starts first with uh, just understanding what you're trying to actually accomplish, um, you know, what your key objectives are. And that's where, that's where it changes between training and inferencing. Because like I was saying in, in my talk earlier, you know, training your objective may be, the number one priority is just time to train. Um, and power and, and cost are a lot lower down on the list. Um, and also things like predictability and things, maybe not, they don't matter as much. Uh, on the training side, but on the inferencing side, um, you know, it's it's prioritizing what you really care about because you're you're probably deploying at scale, um, and so now all of a sudden, you know, cost efficiency, power efficiency, consistency of performance, those all start to um, start to move up the up the ladder in terms of the the priorities. So I think first it's it's you know it's understanding what your priorities are, it's understanding the requirements for the actual model. You know, how big is the model? What's the memory footprint? Is there a way to actually optimize that? Um, you mentioned earlier a lot of the parameters useless. I was talking to a company um, that um, has a, a big foundational model, 
And after they did the initial training, um, which was many, many billions of parameters, I mean, they've, they found now that 95% of the parameters um, have no bearing whatsoever on the final results. Now, you wouldn't know that until you actually went through the months of training. Um, so they, did, they successfully proved out that they could build a model that big um, and that it could generate many interesting results. But in the end, like, they can go and cut out 95% of it um, with no decrease in accuracy. And, and you're right, sometimes actually some of the data is actually um, detrimental putting more data in. So it's also looking at where are the, where are the um, ways that you can actually economize the model itself. And then it's about picking the right piece of hardware um, that it's going to most efficiently fit into, uh, which from our perspective, most of the time, you know, we think is, is a CPU for, for most models. But if you need to use a GPU, um, at least pick one that consumes the least amount of power and is the most efficient. Thanks. Yeah. So, uh, fun story. Are, are there big nerds in the in the room? <laughs> uh, it's easy to see you. Like uh, you have long hairs and you have some hoodies. So, uh, quick story and, and funny story. I, I did run like a lot of benchmarks on hardware. This is my my job in the past. If you're doing training, what's important for you is the bandwidth between the disk and the GPU. And what you're gonna do? You're gonna load your truck, like with big batch and you're gonna launch on the GPU. So you do care about the size of the highway. When you're doing in France, you're looking at cost, the first thing, and latency. And so I did run some tests, say, how can I optimize my cost? And how do I put as many cards as possible, GPU cards as possible, on the same motherboard? Because a part of the cost is the motherboard, and then you have the, um, the different GPUs. It happens that if you take the PCI Express, so it's been technical, but like the size of the highway, and you divide by two, it doesn't change when you're doing in France. If you divide again by two, it doesn't change. If you, again, you divide by two, you start to have like five to 10% loss in, in, in performance. It means that you can put like four, six, eight times more uh, cards on the same hardware because you can split the highway and having one line per GPU. If you're doing training, if you do that, you're gonna kill the performance, and then you're gonna kill the price per uh, dollar that you're gonna have. So define what is your use case, what is your final goal, and find the way to have the best setup. So there is always a bottleneck. If you're running, let's go into databases. If you're running in databases, your bottleneck is the memory, it's the RAM. If you're running like, uh, web servers, your bottleneck is the number of CPU and number of threads you're gonna have. And after you choose what is the key element that is the blocking, then you're gonna find what is the next best, best hardware. So if I took a, uh, take a database, the best price for me, the bottleneck is the RAM, I'm gonna take the highest RAM possible. And then I'm gonna find which CPU is able to handle that big amount of RAM. And then I'm gonna choose my CPU. Don't do it the other way around. If you're running a web server, you need to have as many threads as possible. And then you choose which RAM is, is applicable. And then you're gonna choose your NVMe. Do you need NVMe actually? You don't. So stop buying the top gun infrastructure, find what is the best for your use case. The same for AI, it's been the same for database, it's been the same for web server. It's been the same like for years and years. It's just a different way to buy it because the cost of the item that you need to leverage is way higher than what it used to be. So GPU is probably 90% of the hardware that you, you're buying when you're buying a, a server like that. So okay. it's just like being bigger in terms of problem, but the problem remains the same. What is your case? How do you optimize? You want to add something about hardware? Um, yeah, I agree a lot with uh, what you say, Jeff. Um, w when developing model, um, you are tempted to make it work. Uh, that's your main goal first. Uh, but it's easy to overlook the compression phase and just try to um, find the proper hardware uh, too soon. Uh, it's really important to, uh, to focus on compressing the models first, uh, because um, uh, most of the time you have uh, a bunch of useless, of useless parameters uh, in them. Um, and uh, at Poda, uh, we uh, always try to make the model runs, uh, run on CPU first. And if we really don't achieve this, then the GPU is the last resort. Um, but that's our, our main focus, yeah. CPU first. Okay, and so uh, if I understand the, your opinions is that uh, the two KPIs are uh, uh, latency and cost for your inference? We agree? Mm -hmm. Okay, so now 
about the future, if our startup is growing, we want to scale. So scaling is uh, challenging. So um, what are your tips uh, to get ready to scale? And maybe you need to think when you are building, not when you are scaling, because it's too late, maybe. What are the bottlenecks? Yeah, I, I think we've hit you know a, a bunch of the bottlenecks already. I, you know, I, I think it is um, you know the bottlenecks are um, obviously cost, which we've hit a bunch of times. Uh, it's it's power efficiency. Um, it's also availability of of the hardware um, because again, when you're training, you're probably uh, running that training task in one deployment in one data center somewhere in a big cluster. Um, inferencing is a totally different beast. Um, and so you need to uh, be able to pick hardware that's readily available anywhere around the world, uh, whether that's in different geographies or whether it's different physical locations. Um, so you know, picking hardware that has flexibility um, that's widely available is, uh, is critically important in the inferencing and scaling phase. Um, so, exactly what you said, in France is like production, and that's not a new problem that you have. Um, the big competitor that has an orange logo, I won't name, in free letters, the reason why they leave is because Black Friday. In Black Friday, you have a spike, and you need to have the availability of the inference. The inference was a website, okay? It's the same today. If you're doing like speech recognition, you need to have your website up to date, uh, very likely to scale between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. That's not a new problem. It's the same for the website, it's the same for Black Friday, it's the same for like weeks of days, the same for your IT, for the size of the VPN, and that's what we saw with the COVID. Um, the VPN were like needed to scale, etc. So you need to think about it as a website, and you need to think about the traffic, and you need to find what is the right provider to have the stock and the flexibility while not eating your cost. And, and the problem is like we have a big starvation of GPU. I was in San Francisco like this summer. It's funny, you had some meetups that were dedicating on how do I get availability for the GPUs? Because every time there are GPUs coming in the market, they are pre 